Hi, everybody. It's Mark Fisher. Welcome to our channel. Our Scientology story is peeling the onion. Janice is still on vacation in Europe on a cruise, and she'll be back probably next week. But I just wanted to welcome you all to our channel. And we've got a special guest today, and he's an old friend of mine and somebody that you all probably know very well. And it is Mark Headley, otherwise known as Blown for Good. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, guys. Hey, Mark. <laughs> It's good to have you here. I've been trying to, you've been busy all summer, but I, I wanted to, uh, one of the reasons I wanted you on is because I, I reread your book. I actually listened to the audio book and I, it was, I was, I'd read it when it first came out, but I re-listened to, you know, or I read it on the audio and I loved it. And I, I wanted to talk to you. I had questions and things like that, that I wanted to ask you. So I'm glad that you could come on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I love going on other channels. Um, other SPTV channels or even just other channels that are covering the subject of Scientology. Um, I think that when I go on other channels, the pressure's off me because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the comments and I'm watching yeah. this and I'm getting the media and I'm checking this. And the, so when I can just sit back and answer questions, that's easy for me. Um, and, um, and usually um other people will ask questions that i wouldn't think to uh, bring up on my own when i'm just doing no a thing. exactly well I've so got it's, for you for sure it's just a different dynamic and i love it and and um i also like getting um other channels that are doing stuff as part of sptv i love uh going on their channels if that's going to help them get a few more views or watch hours or subscribers or whatever they're trying to do so uh and you know, you can't go wrong with a guy named Mark. That's probably no, going to no, go no, your no. way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, just to let the viewers know, what we're going to do is uh, uh, basically I've got uh, some slides and some questions I wanted to ask Mark about his book, and uh, we'll tell the stories. Then um, we're going to actually answer questions after that. So if you've got a question, just write the word question. Uh, in the chat and uh, it'll make it easier for us to spot it. And of course, if you want a super sticker, super uh, chat, you can do that too. But uh, yeah, if you want to do that, we'll answer questions. The other thing we're going to do right before questions is we're going to do a merch give and giveaway. I'm going to give away a coffee mug from our channel, from our nice. merch store, so people can uh, participate and and uh, win that if they would like as well. So uh, before, so I'm ready to start. How about you, Mark? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, I want to tell quickly a story of how you got to the international base up at, in Gilman Hot Springs, because I was working for David Miscavige at the time as the corporate liaison in charge, and I basically was his guy at the Gold Base, and he was still the chairman of the board of uh, Religious Technology Center. But anyway, um, we had to get personnel up to Gold, up to that location, uh, to basically get personnel for the manufacturing area for the cassette tape line. And I had, uh, I ran somebody uh, named Cheryl Detch, if I'm sure you remember her, Cheryl. Yep. And Claudia Olander. Yeah. And uh, they were down in pack trying to find people to get them to who qualified to yep. come up to the IT base. And one of those people happened to be you, right, Mark? That's right. They had, um, they'd been producing uh cassette tapes of L. Ron Hubbard's lectures for years at Golden Era Productions. And it had turned out that they had produced about uh, 300,000 cassettes that you couldn't hear L. Ron Hubbard when he was talking. So they're considered overt products. Ba they're bad cassettes. And um, these cassettes cost about a, a dollar each. So that's essentially they wasted three hundred thousand dollars at least. There, there might be even more than that that was wasted in terms of production masters and copies. And there's all sorts of, <clears throat> excuse me, there's all sorts of steps that happen before the cassette stage, and and those were all badly produced as well. So um, they took every single person that made the cassettes except for one and they sent them to the RPF or they kicked them out of Scientology. And the one person that they kept was a woman by the name of Clarice 
Brousseau, or right. her maiden name was Barnett, and she was Shelley Miscavige's sister. That's right. And she was yeah. the only one who didn't go to the RPF or get kicked out of the Sea Org. And she used to be like in the Sea Organization, she'd work with L. Ron Hubbard. Clarice mm -hmm. and her sister both worked with um, L. Right. Ron Hubbard when he first started the Sea Organization. And um, this woman, uh, Clarice, I want to say she was in her late 30s at this point, maybe even 40s. Um, she'd been in Scientology in the Sea Org for two decades or more. And she was a lieutenant junior grade. So she had bars and, you know, rank, uh, executive officer rank. And um, when I got there, she was like, uh, you know, petty officer second class or something she was like a you might she, you, the next thing up from like a swamper right, you know right. po3 or po2 or whatever it was and um so even though she didn't go to the rpf she did get demoted uh substantially and was in big let me, trouble let me ask you a question i want to ask you okay what was yeah. your first impression when you arrived at the gold base like a lot of people they didn't know where it was it was a secret location right so yeah, when you arrived did you arrive at night or day do you remember yeah i arrived at night um and in the sea organization you don't get a lot of sleep los angeles the international headquarters doesn't really matter so i'm pretty sure that the person who drove me up i want to say it was either cheryl who drove me up or no it was actually a um, a woman by the name of Renee Norton. She oh, sure. was she was the executive over the personnel department at the time, right. yeah. which was called like the supercargo. Right. And Renee Norton drove me up, and um, I think I fell asleep in the car when we were on the way to the base. So I just we're like, oh, we're going to the ant base. And I was like, oh, great. How long do you think it's going to be? And she said, oh, we'll get there when we get there. You're not even supposed to discuss the length of the drive to the ant base because then somebody could just go, okay, if you went 65 miles an hour for this long, so it must be in this area somewhere. So um, it's about anyway. 90 minutes. So people yeah. know it's 90 minute drive. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, with traffic in LA, it could be yeah. a three or four yeah, hour drive, absolutely. Yeah. Um, which I often made it do if I had to go between <laughs> because, you know, why not? Um, but uh, yeah, I think Renee, Dor Dor Renee Norton drove me up there. And when we arrived, I, I was <laughs> my brain was almost about to break. When we arrived, like I could see, like the road was getting a little bit bumpy. We were going down... Um, we, we went from Los Angeles, so we took the 101, I think, to the 10. And we took the 10 okay. almost the entire way. The 10, uh, Interstate 10, the 10 freeway or the Interstate 10, I-10. We took that up to, Bo yeah, we got off at Beaumont or we got off um, Jackrabbit Trail or yeah. Gilman Springs, whatever the exit is. And then we drove this really rough road. And when we did that, um, it was bumpy and I was like, oh, we must be there. Now it's dark. We left at like seven or eight o'clock at night in Los Angeles. So we're getting there. It's like nine or 10 o'clock at night. It's dark. And as we pull up to the international headquarters, there's a giant sign on the highway. It says Golden Era Productions. And I'm like, okay, so let me get this straight. This fucking place is a secret. You don't want anybody to know where it is, but there's a motherfucking LED sign on the highway that says right. tours welcome and golden air productions. And I'm like, huh? Like it was bewildering to me. Like that's not the way to keep a secret. <laughs> no, 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 no. And different when I arrived at back in 1982, it, you, you drove up, there were no lights. There was one little light outside the guard booth, which was at that time was by the garage. And yeah. so it was pitch black and you drive up to this little light and that was it, you know, it was pretty, pretty wild. It's a Wasn't stuff. that a gas station in the yeah. days past? Yeah, so it's like one of these highway where there's like an awning and then there's a few pumps yeah. there. And yeah, I've seen, um, a lot of people over the years have sent me the resort pictures 
like people that went there when it was a resort it was called gilman hot springs and it was a right. natural springs and people sent me postcards and matches and ashtrays that say massacre canyon inn and yeah. gilman hot springs california and i always when i see them i try to match it up like oh that's where uh yeah. that's where the hole is or oh that's where the uh that's where we would eat dinner massacre canyon inn was like a place where they had fights like i was told muhammad ali had a match there at the base well, in the Ed massacre Norton. canyon inn where we ate well in the old editing building which then later became the audio building after i left right yeah that ken norton who was uh, a heavyweight champion fighter who fought ali yeah that was his training camp when they first got the property and he was there and they had other other boxers as well wow yeah there was um w there was a comedian um from the uh you know early 1900s names uh wc fields he had performed there and um and it, it was kind of like i'm trying to think you know in um the movie dirty dancing and they go to that sort of country club or that place that's what that that's what gilman hot springs look like it just looked like someplace like that oh i don't hear you dude sorry I muted because no. of my dog. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was like, I had just, I just blew my nose and well, I, I muted I, myself. And I was like, did I somehow mute Mark? No. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I was going to say, what, what, what was it like when you woke up in the morning and you could see where you were with the mountains and all that? Well, so we got to the property and then um, I want to say uh they were like okay you're here you did this i think i had just been approved like um i got approved the day before so as soon as in order to go from the los angeles sea organization facility to the international headquarters um there's a lot of paperwork and you get interrogated on the e-meter and and it could take somebody a year to get through that process so from start to finish easily I, I mean some people did it for five years it, if you uh if you were a sea org member it was almost like that's as high as you can get in the sea org yeah. i mean there are these uh church of spiritual technology and asi author services there's these other kind of like really high up organizations but unless you know you're gorgeous or you're super super skilled at something you're probably not going to go to one of those places um you only they only the really good looking people end up going to those places that's what it seemed like to me like you just have to be like someone who's really easy on the eyes guy or gal um or just very talented at a skill they need otherwise they're not it's it's almost no one is qualified to be able to go to those places the qualifications are so stringent well, but um of how, how here's how we looked at back in those days okay oh my <laughs> goodness you know what's really funny this picture of me yeah. is from scientology i don't have I that picture i they... pulled it down from google i just googled pictures of yeah you and then i pulled it up and i went well there you are at the base is a young your teenager yeah. there I'm that assuming. is at the star of california clipper right. ship and it's on a sea org day which is the one day we would get off a year to just do whatever and um and when we said, oh, this place is horrible and this place is that, and they weren't paying us and they were feeding us crap and it was, you know, we were prisoners. And they're like, well, here you are playing ping pong. I'm like, yeah, you can play <laughs> oh, ping pong in prison too. <laughs> Whatever. I was like, that's, that's your defense is that, well, you did play ping pong. Ping pong, yeah. <laughs> Well, and then on the left, that's me. I'm also at the Star California at the, you know, they had the waterfall at the end of the swimming pool. Yeah, that's uh, and then literally. They had the bird cages. That's yeah, where I'm the, standing. That's where I'm is, standing. This is on the the deck that's closest yeah. to the uh, lower villa as you walk yeah. up that little path. This is right before you would leave 
uh, the Stalic Star of California. But I know exactly where that picture uh, took place that you're in as well. That's right near the, um, you're right. It's right below where like the um, the stairs are that lead down that fountain. Yeah, that's right. And then there was a fountain with the waterfalls and all that. And yeah. I was there for, that picture was, I, I'd just done a wedding for somebody or something like that. But anyway, yeah, that's what we looked like back then. <laughs> yeah. So, so then, um, so that you have to go through this process and they call that clearances. So you're getting clearances and you're getting, it is, it is l literally security clearances to go to that property. And so, um, in my case, I was only doing clearances for like two weeks Yeah, because I, I never, I worked at a, I worked at a Scientology school. I used to work at the Los Angeles org when I was um, like between 10 and 12. I worked at the LA org during the summer. I worked, I was the, I was a communicator for this uh, woman named Reggie Caldwell, who was the deputy commanding officer of Los Angeles um, organization. And, um, and I worked for her and then I stuffed you know, stuffed promo into envelopes and stuff like that. But um, so I did that. I worked at a school. I sold toy airplane gliders across America at malls. Which is amazing. I've heard that story. It's pretty amazing. And, um, and by the time I was 15, I joined the Sea Organization. So when you get these security clearances, like, have you ever robbed a bank? Have you ever worked for the government? Have you ever been part of a media organization? Have you ever seen a psychiatrist? You know, all these things that would disqualify you for your security clearance. I'm like, no, I've been uh, I've been working for you guys the whole time. Well, th and that's why you were so clean. They could get you up there because yeah, so, you basically so, done nothing. Exactly. So one of these people that would be on clearances for a year, they see me and they're like, oh, you're going in session. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, OK, good luck, man. You know, I come and they're telling me like what their their weekly grind is. And I usually do this and I usually do that. And like a week and a half later, I'm like, peace out, bitches. I'm approved. <laughs> and they're like, what? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is also I really at the end of the day, um, I had no idea what the imp base was. I never wanted to go there. I didn't even know it was a thing. And so when they were like, oh, you could go do this. And I was like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I got a good thing going here at ABLE. I'm getting paid minimum wage for 40 hours a week, not the whole 110 we were working, but I'm still getting minimum wage for the 40. Money, yeah. At 16, that's pretty good money too. Yeah, and I had been working at a school and I'd been, I sold the toy airplane gliders. So I was okay at working and making money and you know, that kind of thing. But um, I kind of had a good thing going in Los Angeles. I was doing my thing. I wasn't, it was a pain in my ass and it was, you know, I didn't like all the people I worked with. And I had just gotten busted. Um, just a few months before from my post as the recruiter for uh, the Association for Better Living and Better Education. Living. Yeah. So when um, when I got busted, they put me into accounts, into the Treasury Department. And um, I was really good at that. I, I, I really did. They had unpaid bills and they didn't they had backlogged invoicing and the files were just all just overflowing because they just didn't have anybody doing that and so um i got the area cleaned up i got everything into current i got all the bills paid i got all the invoicing and so i was sort of like oh yeah this is my this is my jam stuff comes in stuff goes out i'm the only guy like i was the only person in the in the accounts department so it wasn't like i was going to get into a fight with somebody about so i was right. just like i'm doing my own thing and so when they were like um they actually came these missionaries came and they brought me this thing and said you you need to read this and it was they send telexes in scientology within the sea Org. <laughs> it was a telex and i'm reading it and it's like the following people have been chosen to go to the international headquarters and i was like okay whatever and i'm assuming this is my sister because you know she's 
she's a better Sea Org member than me. She follows the rules and she sort of plays along. And I'm just like, no, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. And they're like, no, you have to do it. I'm like, oh yeah, no, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so I wasn't the best one. And they, I read the list and I go, okay, yeah, my sister's going to Ant. And they go, read the list again, dummy. And I read the list again. I'm like, oh, my sister's on there, but I'm on there too. And so then I do the clearances. I get to the base and, um, and they're like, oh my God, you're, this is amazing. And, and I know people that are there because I grew up with this guy named Jesse Radstrom. He was at the Ant Base and he, we, we went to the same school. I actually lived with his family. So I knew he was, you talk about yeah. it in your book too. Yeah. Yeah. Almost all of this I actually cover yeah. in the book, but, um, we might be going into more detail or going off on branches that I don't cover, but that's okay. But regardless, um, there was another gal by the name of Ollie Mintz and Ollie Mintz was also at the Ent base and she was like W, uh, WDC C org or WDC programs or something like that at the time. And she was the one who had written that telex that I had read. So, yeah. I was like, oh, and I even thought to myself, I think she put me on the list because she knew me and she's like, yeah, these people are easy to get to the end base because they have never done anything outside of Scientology to disqualify them for being able to work there. And there were, I want to say, at least 30 or 40 people at the international headquarters that had gone to the same Scientology schools I did. They right. went to Delphi, Oregon, or they went to Delphi, Los Angeles, or they went to Mace Kingsley or Delphi and Clearwater or some other Scientology school. There was many of us there. Barrett Oliver went to Apple School. Um, Eric Eisler went to uh, Delphi, Oregon. Tori Mackay that worked directly for David Miscavige. She was one of the first Del uh, Delphi, Oregon graduates. Um, so the, there were, it was sort of like an easy uh, get for the Ent base. If you could get a, somebody in the Sea Org who'd been to one of those things. Um, yeah. So when we get there, um, I'm, I, the, the person they put me to stay with was Jesse. So Jesse Radstrom, Radstrom, he was my, okay. he was my roommate when I got there, yeah. but he was in CMO Int at the time. And, um, so, but we were staying in these apartments in Hemet right. or San Jacinto depends on where you were. But at this time it was in Hemet and it was, um, an apartment complex called the devonshire devonshire, devonshire. yeah <laughs> devonshire and just so people know we had we had moved everybody off the base because we're going to build the birthing buildings and we need to renovate everything and so everybody used to live on the base so then miss Scavage is like oh no we're going to rent all these apartment units in town and we rented quite a few of them for years anyway yeah. go ahead <laughs> well the thing i was going to say is they, they, they did a calculation on how much it would cost to build all these buildings. And I think somebody came up with a figure that was like two and a half million dollars to build apartments for the staff. Right. On the property. And on the property. Yeah. And this was done early on before there were that many people working there. And so they were like, okay, so we need to do that. It's a lot, but we need to do it. Okay, so then they started renting this one place, and then we got some more people, and then they rented another place, and then they got some more. Before you know it, they've got apartments all over Hemet and San Jacinto, and they've spent five million dollars on rents on apartments. And you're like, and you're like, um, I know that you think you should build a building here. And I know you know how much it costs to build a building, yet you spent twice that on apartments. And eventually, I'm gonna say, I think they spent $8 million on apartments in the end, before they moved everybody, yeah. it was somewhere like eight or eight to $9 million. But also, they took out, I think they financed or they did something in relation to the money that they needed to build the birthing buildings. And they secured the money, however they did it, and then they never built them. 
So not only were they paying the rents the whole time, but they were also paying the interest on whatever finance deal they worked out to build the buildings. And um, I remember there was a big investigation at the Ant Base in the, I'm going to say in the early 2000s. And it was like birthing buildings versus apartments. They'd spent like $25 million in the end. And, and and it's David Miscavige, which you know very well. He's he constantly overspends on things like that because rather than doing the right thing and spending the right amount of money, oh, they waste it for years. It's just crazy. Yeah. Not just on this, on everything. Just about. oh yeah. I mean, even when they built the birthing buildings in the end, you weren't there when this happened, Mark. No, no, they were gone. But when they ended up actually building the buildings, they were uh, tens of millions in the end for them to yeah. to build them. But um, somebody. Um, I think David Miscavige or somebody commented that the ceilings seemed a little low. Like that could be a problem. And uh, and why are we kind of like just squeezing everybody? Why couldn't we get a little bit bigger? So um, so they raised the ceilings. They just raised the ceilings. Anyway, um, they built the buildings. They, they framed them. They got everything going. And then they called the air conditioning guys to come in and the air conditioning guys were, where are we supposed to put all the ducks and everything? And they're like, what do you mean? And like, there's no place for the ducks. And they're like, Oh, like when they raised the raised ceilings, the they just ceiling. erased the ducks on the plants. <laughs> they didn't move anything. They just raised the ceiling. Like David Miscavige said, raise the ceiling. We raised the ceilings. Uh, you didn't tell us to, move all that air conditioning stuff up yeah. higher and but so they had to um i mean the built the concrete was poured the buildings were made yeah so i'm not sure how they ever really resolved that because awesome. there was it was they're multi-story buildings so yeah. you can't like stretch them i don't know if they put in mini splits or i don't know what they ended up doing but let me let me uh, let me move forward here on a little yeah. bit, okay? Because you and I were like two ships passing in the night. We really were. When okay? I first because got there, you arrived. Yeah, I was on my way out the door for good. I well, you there. were. When I was first there, you were still walking around. Oh yeah. Um, and and for those who don't know, if you're in Golden Air Productions, that's there's there's about ten different organizations at the international headquarters like even different corporations and different DBAs and different, um, the, each different organization had a different, like, uh, like a, a class. It was like, if you're in Golden Era Productions, that's the lower class. That's the lowest class of Sea Org member at the end of base. And then there's CMO Gold, CMO Int, Exec, Exec Strata, L. Ron Hubbard, Personal Public Relations Office, Exec Strata, WDC, all these different ones, and they go up to RTC. And then even in RTC, it goes, there's a bunch of different divisions, and then there's COB's office. And that's the highest you can be. And so Mark was, his job was corporate liaison in charge or CLIC. And oh, that, see or click. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was about as high as you could get besides being David Miscavige. Like you knew that, oh, that dude's boss is David Miscavige. That's, yeah. that's it, you know? So when you would come around, I was always like, Oh, this fuck, whatever we do, this guy's telling Dave about it. So you better mind your P's and Q's when this guy walks around. And also you were I was very, a pretty good guy. I was a pretty good guy though. Right. I, you I were very kind of like, yeah. yeah, you were very conversational in terms of an executive, most executives, including like, um, the guy that was the boss of me in that place, his name was Jason Benick. And he was like, he was a really short, oh yeah, there he is. That guy, he doesn't look like that anymore. He doesn't have any hair, it's all shaved. By the way, that, that picture is my wedding and he's standing behind me because he worked for me at that time and he, he was uh, the best man in my wedding. So Wow, is that also at the ship? Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah the, the, up, where the the foxhole, up where the up where the foxhole, you know, the, the front of the ship was. That is where that ping pong picture is yeah. in, in that exact spot. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so you could get married there. Place. You could wear, yeah. you could play ping pong. It was a very, very happy place. Oh, yeah. um, anyway, um, can you put it back to the other way? Just because yeah. we had it that way the yeah, whole yeah. time. I, oh, sorry uh, about that. Yeah, yeah, no, no it's, it's all it's good. Me, um, otherwise, I can't even see what's going on because I've yeah, already I, made yeah, the I screen really nice. tiny. Um, so yeah, we. Um, we we had J- Jason Bennick was my boss and he was there all day all ever you know pretty much, um, so we talked about before those they made all those over product cassettes all the bad quality cassettes, and every night, um, all of the Golden Era Productions crew would come to the area where they made the cassettes. And, and there it is, that's building 36. So those windows that are not covered by trees on the first floor, you can see right in between those two big trees, there's like one, two, three, three windows. That is where the cassettes were made. Those three windows are where the cassettes were produced. Um, and, and these were L. Ron Hubbard lectures that were sold to all Scientologists all over the world. So that, that's what the cassettes were. They, they were recorded cassettes that we would package and then sell. Go ahead. Yeah. So every day, all of the crew from Golden Era Productions would come into this area and we would, um, we would put the cassettes through a heat tunnel and warm them up and then peel the the paper labels off of them and then use alcohol to clean off any um adhesive residue and then those cassettes were sold like in los angeles to be able to To record stuff on yeah Yeah. they'd they'd sell them for like three five cents or something like that each these cassettes cost about a buck each because they had this special kind of metal TDK was the brand and they made a very special formulation that had metal in it that would um, that would just have a better f- uh, dynamic range of sound it just had it, it was it was the, the best, best quality the best quality cassette tape you could have was TDK metal and that's right everything had to be the best on these things yeah it was called TDK MA I think that stood for metal alloy and um and we would buy the cassettes the the these giant reels of yeah yeah, of tape and it was on a hub and that hub would snap into the machines that would do the high speed recording and you could fit about yeah that's it gauss the name of the company that produced the the master machine and the slave machines right. you would play a master of the l ron hubbard lecture it was like a one inch was it a one inch i think it was, yeah, it was I a production say, master yeah yeah right. i want to say it was a one inch master and the master was recorded at regular speed and the master would be on this thick tape that would play through this master machine in in high speed and it would play it at 32 times high speed and these slave recorders would record the sound coming out of the master at 32 times um speed as well and so yeah that's a slave that's a it's called a gauss or c-tech gauss um pancake recording slave and you can see you put on the pancake on the on the left side there and then you thread it through this thing and you wrap it around the right side and then you put it in like standby mode and record and then the master spins up and once it's to speed there's a little piece of foil at the head of the lecture and as soon as that foil goes by it tells all the machines it's time and then they get up to speed and then they all start recording and um and so these machines were broken and that's why they produced all these lectures that didn't sound good you say when you say broken okay they were they were 
at factory specification, right? But that was not good enough for David Miscavige on L. Ron Hubbard's lectures. They had to be better than factory specifications, okay? And basically, he would listen for the finest little problem or, or issue, whereas the normal consumer doesn't care about that. And that was what the problem was. So these guys, yeah. you guys were, uh, were, the people in there were trying to, to get these machines to better than factory specifications to David Miscavige's ears quality saying is okay. And it was insanity in terms of, cause it was going around the clock 24 hours a day for weeks. Yeah. Weeks, so right? uh, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to explain that, but um, in, in layman's terms, if you have a master recording, and then you make copies of it, you want the, the copy to sound as good as the master or as good as it can, as it can. to the master. And most people, um, they have like, um, well, the way that we tested and the way everything was based is that there are, there's a frequency range that goes from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So 20 HZ, to 20 K H Z and all of these individual frequencies in that range, um, exist, um, on the master. And then when you make the copy, you want it to be around the same level, all of those frequencies. If they're at this level on that recording, you want them to be at that level on the copy. And so the way they would explain it was, it's this frequency range plus or minus a, a, a three or four decibels. Deep decibels, DB. Yeah. yeah. And the machines could do plus or minus two, three to four decibels all day long. That was fine. You could do that. For David Miscavige, that additional decibel was unacceptable. So instead of having it plus or minus three or plus or minus four, he, it was his requirement that every copy be plus or minus no more than two dBs on certain frequencies and no more than a dB and a half on the frequencies which you can hear. So the frequencies which most people can't hear, he was like, okay, those could be plus or minus two. But the ones that most people can hear, the ones that are in my voice right now and that you're hearing on this recording, he want, wanted those frequencies to not be more than plus or minus one and a half decibel. Now, most people can hear the difference between a decibel and zero like if you said oh this is at 20 oh this is at 21 most people would be like i think it went a little bit louder like it's almost indiscernible a half a decibel is very likely undiscernible so if it was a db and a half uh, you may be like eh, it sounds a little different but it's not that much um so my job was that on the master recording, there's a bunch of tones that are on that master recording. And they're only at the very, very end of the pancake. So all of those copies are going by and recording the lecture. And when that little um, piece of foil goes by, it tells the master, don't play these tones on the tape. So the slaves never hear them. The slaves only hear them on the last time it's going to go around. It says, okay, put those tones down. And so then when you get the, the pancake, um, I would thread it onto my machine. And right there at the very end of the recording would be those tones that were on the master tape. And I would use a spectrum analyzer and a bunch of different uh, Hewlett Packard 400 FL voltmeter to see what the level tone was. And then I'd use the spectrum analyzer to analyze the pink noise and what those were. And then I would create a graph of that frequency range. And then I would print it out on a sheet. And the sheet had a an area where those frequencies could be already pre-printed onto the paper. So when I printed out the graph, it would plot the frequencies within the zone it should be. 
And if it wasn't in that zone, then I would flunk it. And I would say, that's not okay. Um, it's got to go back. Okay, so... Well, I, they, I, just just to put it in practical terms, okay? Yeah. Because I've, I've had a long time to, to think about this, right? Yeah. The scavenge was checking these things with the highest quality headphones yeah. that existed. They were called Stax headphones. Yes. So literally... Uh-oh. I, did, I lost you for a second. If you can still hear me. Um, I don't know if you guys are not hearing. Oh, I'm, I'm back efforts. now. I, okay, good. I'm Sorry. back now. Sorry about Sorry. that. I touched my ears. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, he's listening to them on these really super high quality. So he's like splitting hairs. Okay. Oh yeah. And 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 and, it, and he set up this whole thing where you had to quality control all the stuff, and you did an excellent job and all that stuff, right? But the average consumer. They didn't really care. You're listening to L. Ron Hubbard from 1962 pontificate about something. And as long as you can hear him, who cares? You know what I mean? It was like it was a, it was good quality. Everything was quality, quality, quality tape, cassette shells. Everything was like that. But like because his standards were so high. Right. Yeah. That's why all this stuff happened. <laughs> well, that was also just the first checkpoint. Right. So it would get, it would get so you would have the um, we had sixteen of these slave machines. Slave. Yeah. So you'd have one master and a and an L. Ron Hubbard lecture is usually about forty five minutes on side one and then forty five minutes on side on two. So when you have a cassette, you're recording, and this is a crazy thing too. You're recording side one forward but you're recording side two backward. So um, it's kind of, it's kind of wild, uh, you know, technique when you think about it, but that master is playing side one, two channels of side one going forward. It's playing side two going backwards and the slaves are recording whatever they're getting. And then, so then when you check it, I would check the, um, I would check the tones, make sure those are good. And as long as they were good, then the pancake would be marked a pass and it would be put in a pile, a stack. And all the passes would add up and all the stack, all the flunks would add up. And then the, the ones that flunked would go and get um, erased. And then they'd, we could reuse those again. Um, eventually when we ran out of tape, we would use all the flunks, we'd erase them and then use those to record again. But, um, yeah, but, but that's why I left. I mean, you know, this, this line, they were trying to get this Gauss line to David Miscavige's standards and literally people like Bruce Plotz, Gary Luigi, Gary, uh, Lou, all these people and up all night around the clock for weeks at the same time, the flood had happened at the base in August of that summer, right? So there was a mission that was in there that was causing all the stuff. And I basically got to the point where I was getting in trouble because, oh, they weren't reaching Miscavige's standards. And I just got to the point where I went like, the hell with this, this is never gonna happen. And so that was when I was like, adios, I'm out of here, you know, after yeah. he beat me up and there's other <laughs> things that happened too. But and those are, and some of those, line, well, that time when he beat you up is in my book because yeah. I got in trouble for, um, I didn't have glasses, but I needed glasses. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I had passed a bunch that were like a 10th of a decibel into the, the no zone, but be, the plotter doesn't always print it right. And the, the guy that printed me the forms that I would use, it was printed on a Mimeo machine and there's play in that. And so it was always just like, ah, yeah, it's good. It's in there. Um, but no, it was a 10th of a DB, DB off. And so what I was saying before is, once I would pass them, then they would go to the cassette loaders and then they would load those pancakes into what are called uh, the cassette tape itself. Like it was called a, um, a King loader. The, the brand name was right. King that made these loaders. And, and the cassettes, before they have tape in them, they're cassette shells. And then that little plastic thing that you slide the label into and then you put that. I think the the printed thing is called a J card. 
because it looks yeah. like a J when it slides into it. And then I can't remember what the case is. Maybe we just call them cases or I don't remember. Anyway, so they would take these blank shells, put them into this machine, and then this spooling machine that was made by this company, King, the King Loader, would take the spool and it would thread it into the cassette and splice it and then reel it, use the cassette to reel in. And you would set the machine, you'd say, this lecture is this length. And so it'd spool in the exact to the second length that that cassette needed to have in it. And then it'd splice it and then it'd put it in there. And so then after all that was done, you got to have a quality control after that because if somebody, if the guy running the king loader puts in the wrong time, it's going to chop the lecture in the middle. So you got to listen to the beginning, you got to listen to the middle, and then you got to listen to the end. And what that person does is they have the same time the guy who made that original production master that they were using to copy. Um, that's playing on the master machine and playing out to all the slaves. There's another copy that was made at the exact same time as that. And that's a quarter inch reference master. And that reference master, we would have on a reel to reel machine. And then we had this Nakamichi cassette deck. It was, I remember it to this day. It was a Nakamichi um, XL, uh, XL 1000, I think it was called. Is it a, a DXL 1000? ZXL 1000. The Probably Nakamichi are. ZXL 1000. And we and so you would you would play the original. You'd go one, two, three, play the cassette. You'd cue it up exactly right. And then we had a switch on our headphones and we could go A, listen to the master, B, B then you listen to the cassette, A, and you go back and forth. And you look at the VU meters, the volt unit meters, volume unit meters. You look at those and you'd see a peak when he said, and in this lecture, and then you'd see where it peaked. And then when you go into the next, the copy and say in this lecture, and then you'd see exactly where it peaked. And you would be, comp you would be comparing the right. A to the B. And so it's called doing an AB. If you're in that industry, it's yeah. it's kind of a way you check things. Okay, we did that for every single pancake. We did the check I did to computer analyze the frequencies using a spectrum analyzer and a volt a VU meter. And all these things have to be is perfectly calibrated to make sure everything's good. And the machine that I checked the pancakes on was made by a company called Studer, and it was a A80QC cassette Studer. Just this tape machine that I was checking was a $35,000 tape machine that I was playing the pancakes on, and it was heavily modified to, um, to be able to play everything exactly the way they wanted. Anyway, so then they would check the, um, they would do an AB of the cassettes, and then once every single pancake passed my station and every single pancake, um, this was called the audible QC. So one is pancake QC. That was my job. And then it would go to the next QC, which was audible QC. And the person who was the audible QC was my boss. Her name was Linnea. And Linnea used Linnea, to be bigger. in the in the CL office in RTC and she got yeah. busted. And then she went into the tapes department at the same time I did. She wasn't there when I got there. She right. was busted out of RTC after I got there and then assigned to be my boss. And she was a nightmare for me because here I am. I'm a brand new Sea Org member. I'm a teenager. I think I was I want to say I was 17 at this point. I just had my birthday when I got to the Imp base. I got there like a day or two after my birthday, or a few days after my birthday. Um, I was 17 years old, and she was in her like late 20s, but she was in Religious Technology Center, so she was in the highest Sea Org organization directly under David Miscavige, but also um, she got busted. So if somebody in RTC gets in trouble and they get assigned to Golden Era Productions, they sort of have to prove themselves 
as the mo the best Sea Org member they can be. So they're very strict and very by the book according to L. Ron Hubbard policies and flag orders and all these other things. And here I am like, ah, eh, whatever, you know, what are you gonna do? And she was she would have none of it. Anyway, so she was my boss and she was um the tapes QC. And I was the pancake QC and I also did Audible QC and she was the day shift pancake QC um, held from above. If you in the Sea Org, if you do a job that's under you, um, you do that job HFA held from above. So she was the day shift pancake QC and then she was also the um, audible QC and then I was the uh, night shift pancake QC and then I became um, qual what was called quality control gold and I was um, the QC over all of Golden Era Productions, including Linnea, which was kind of weird in the end. But um, so what had happened after you left was, um, and also when it, it was funny when I would write to somebody that wasn't at Golden Era Productions, because if I would write to somebody that I needed something from Los Angeles, I would it would be from Pancake QC, Golden Era Productions. <laughs> People are like, Wow, international headquarters must be amazing. They got people checking their pancakes for them to make sure they're like, what, got enough maple syrup on them or something? <laughs> it's just like a, it's a so out of context thing. Right. And even people at the base would be like, uh, what you Pancake do? QC, you here? I'd be like, yep, yeah, right here, Pancake QC, you know? <laughs> it was the most bizarre Sea Org post title ever and oh by the way anybody out there wondering i have quality checked a pancake or two in my time not the tape <laughs> ones not the tape ones <laughs> let me, anyway let me, but, i want to move oh, you, yeah, go, yeah, ahead, go ahead this up and i was going to move on to something else i was yeah, going to yeah. ask okay yeah so i left because i was like i'm out of here you know i had seen all the abuse i worked close with this miscavige i was gone and of yeah. course you're just fresh-faced Green behind the ears arrived, right? So we kind of passed in the night, right? But I wanted to ask you a question, okay? Again, this is yeah. from, from your book, right? This yeah. is a picture. Um, I was going to add this picture here. This is what Miscavige yeah. looked like in 91, around the time that I left and you were there. Right? Well, that's that's from the Ted Koppel interview, right. that picture. Right. Night, uh, ABC Nightline. I want to ask you a question, okay? Yeah. I know because you worked with around Miscavige for years, right? Yeah. There there's always a point where he considers that you're somebody that can get things done right in other words yeah. like, like somebody is somebody i can depend on and i yeah. want to ask you when was that for you when did he go like give it to headley he'll take care of it or whatever because he does that and it's always you know it's not like that at first at first he's he gives you a lot of grief and all that but when did he actually start relying on you to get things done well um, I want to say we did the, um, the, this whole place where we worked, um, it was, it was in the manufacturing area, but everybody knew it as the Gauss line. Right. That's what everybody called it. Oh, you going to the Gauss line? Oh, the, the Gauss line flap. Oh, they still haven't gotten the Gauss line up. Everybody just called it as the Gauss line. That's what it was always called, even though. Um, that's just the manufacturer name that it's, it's like Q-tip or Kleenex. It's just like, oh, that's the Gauss line. Okay. Um, it had been down for months and months and months before I got there right. and I got there in May and I was actually the very first person to arrive when I got there. There was one other guy that had been there, but he was working in what was called the finishing area, which is like the packaging area and uh where they shrink wrap stuff and put the cassettes inside the binders Tony and, Cifarelli? it was uh dan Crocini was the okay. guy that had arrived before me and he was a uh very decorated uh sea Org veteran he'd been in the sea Org for 20 years mm -hmm. um in los angeles and and he was promoted and he was an officer and everything i remember i was always like oh this guy's uh you know He's got a mustache. He's pretty old, you know. Um, anyway, he but uh, hadn't even started shaving yet. Yeah, he was. Yeah, exactly. I was literally like, didn't even have any hair on my balls when I showed up at this joint. Anyway, um, so 
Dan Crescini was there. He was in finishing. And I was actually going to be in finishing. Uh, that was what they had picked for me. Uh -huh. um, and then they found out, oh, this guy knows electronics and stuff like that. And so it was decided, oh, no, he should actually be in the Gauss line proper where the equipment is, where the technical equipment is. And so there was a bunch of technicians, Bob Ferris, Bruce Plotz, um, a guy named Gary Liu, who was also known as Luigi. Luigi. And Luigi was a genius. So was a Bob genius. and so was Bruce. Self-taught. Yeah. Self-taught genius, yeah. I think Bruce might have actually been the smartest of all yeah. of them. But um, Gary Lee was, uh, he could design audio circuits and modify existing ones and troubleshoot. He built and so from scratch, he built equipment. Yeah. You know? yeah. And Bob Ferris was the technician that was assigned to the Gauss line. He was at his post title was the tapes technician. And he was newly put there. He was actually before that, he, I think he was an auditor. He was in the qualifications department. He was a counselor who had just happened to know some stuff about audio. So like, oh, we should put him in there as a technician. Um, so it was him, Gary Liu and Bruce Plotz just hunched over these machines, circuit boards out, testing all day, all night. And this had been going on all the way up until I got there and it was Bruce and Gary and they were trying to fix it and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't. We had a guy named um, Jeff Campbell that was like a, a Scientologist, but he was a technician and he was there trying to help us figure it out. And and How because about, did, I was, was John McCormick, was John McCormick involved? Do you remember John, John McCormick was really um, more of the meter guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. E-meters. He did every once in a while, they'd ask him ideas and stuff because we yeah. were doing something that had never been done before. Right. The machines you exceeding, themselves. You were exceeding the factory. Specifications. Yeah. The machines themselves could, um, they could reproduce a quality signal, but not as tight as David Miscavige wanted it. So in the end, and the, this is the funniest thing in the end, um, they had figured out how to get the circuit board to do what we wanted, but tuning it was the problem. And it was they were it was very rookie um, stuff that was happening. And and essentially what it boiled down to in the end, this is the stupidest thing. But this is what it was. It was the temperature of the room. That was it. The temperature of the room was the problem. They had got. Well, they'd gotten these, well, they had moved. This Gauss line had been operating for years and years and years yeah. in another location. Right. Well, they built this brand new building. It had fancy new air conditioning. Right. And anyone in, in the electronics world where you want to keep that in the 70s, low 70s or below. And so they had this place on 69 all the time. And that's what it was just cold in there. Yeah. Well, they would open these windows, those windows that I showed you that you put up those three yeah. little windows and that manufacturing building, they'd have those blinds open right there. Those ones right in the middle of those three ones on the first floor that are on a, on a, a blocked. Okay. Those, the sun would come in. Mm -hmm and it'd heat everything up. And then we do all these tests, we do all these frequency, we put it, we just had tones, we're just recording. We had a master tape that just had tones and that was just playing full time. And it was going out to the slaves. And what would happen is we would tune the slaves to that that tone, we'd make sure it matched. And if this frequency was high, there was a little thing you could adjust and you could change. You couldn't change individual frequencies, but you could change like the low frequencies. You could change the mid frequencies and you could change the high frequencies. And you just had a little potentiometer that would either make those go up or down. And so we'd spend the whole day tuning everything, getting it all perfect, all into the night. And 
like till like f- six o'clock in the morning. And then we get everything perfect. And then we go to bed for a few hours. We get up, 8.30, come in, and everything would be totally different. And no one could figure it out. And so what you had was you had the air conditioner itself just being colder or hotter. And then you'd have the, um, this, the sun and just the outside temperatures affecting everything. And then it was also maybe we had to move a bunch of tape in. And so we'd prop the doors to the Gauss line open into the finishing area where the loading dock was connected to and all that. And we'd be bringing a bunch of stuff in. And then all of a sudden, all the slaves on that side of the room would have a totally different tuning. Wow. And so it took, really took an about, mm, I'm going to say it took about September, August or September, maybe for them to really figure that out. It took months for them to go, oh, it's the temperature. And we put all these thermometers all around the room. And then they ended up just ripping out the air conditioning system that was part of the building. And they put in a very, very special air conditioning system just for that room. And then once we did that, then you could... You could just say, okay, here's our baseline. We're always going to have it at this temperature. Now let's tune everything. And then we, we were able to do it. And then eventually we were able to figure it. It was very funny. So what they would do is it, it's kind of like a dog and pony show to fix these machines because you have to uh, run the master, then run the slave, then take the, ma- the tape off the slave, go check it on the – QC Studer, and then you'd be like, oh, it's a DB2 high. And then they'd hook up this whole test rig to the slave, get the tape rolling. And then they had a way they could play it back right after it was being recorded on the slave itself. And then they would adjust this little thing until it would be like, okay, that's a DB lower, a one decibel lower. And they'd be like, okay, good take all that off of the slave. Now let's run a test, run a test, then bring it over to me. And then I would taste it, take, uh, test it. Well, just to tune one slave could take two or three hours because you, when you tweak it and then it goes too far, then you're like, okay, we run it. We do all that, put the thing back on, test it, run a test, be like, oh, now it's two dBs too low. You'd be like, <gasps> and so you would just do that and then after two hours, it'd be like, okay, that one's pretty good. It's pretty flat. It's like almost no deviation, plus or minus, across all those frequencies, which is almost impossible to achieve. Anyway, so, but every, though I don't remember why this was a thing, but I think David Miscavige was like, you got to tune these things every day. You don't really. If they're good and they're they in the they range, then, then they would, yeah. should just stay that way. But for some reason, they were, um, we were over tuning these things and the tuning took forever. And if a slave wasn't good, then we couldn't use it. And so it would just be down. And so out of the 16 slaves, maybe there was only eight slaves that would just always stay tuned. And these other ones would, just wouldn't for some reason. They would wildly fluctuate. So, um, and it would take forever to tune them. And so um, it was sort of like by the time you got all of them working, then the ones that were already working would now be going out of tune. And they just wouldn't stay or I don't remember exactly what it was. But because it took so long to test and, and find and tune them, I was like, why do you get all this equipment when you're tuning it. If it says it's a little high, just tweak it down a little bit and then run another test right away. Like it takes one minute to run a test. Let me check it. If it's too high, just tweak it down and then 
do another test. And they're like, but how do you know how much you're tweaking it down? And I would argue, well, you don't know how much you're tweaking down because you'll always overcompensate. And we always have, end up going too high, too low, too high, too low. And then you do the next frequency range, too high, too low, too high, too low. And so I invented this thing called blind tweaking, which is if it's a little high, then tweak it down just a little teeny bit, like a hair, just like just a little hair. And so um, if I was checking one and it was too high, or even if it was just, it, was, it wasn't too high to, to be a flunk, but it looked like it might be creeping up a little bit, then I would just tweak it down. Like, why don't you tweak it before it's out of range? And so I just started tweaking the slaves willy nilly when these guys had this whole procedure and you had to hook this up, I was just like, fuck that. This is all bullshit. I'm going to go in there and just blind tweak it. And then slowly over a period of days, all the slaves were fine and they were all kind of like in their zone and everything was fine. And then we could run. Well, the, the whole purpose, David Miscavige says, they need to be able to produce 50,000 cassettes every single week. And I don't know how he came up with that figure, but it was sort of like mathematically, if everything went 98% right, with every single step of the line and nobody went to dinner and nobody took a dump and nobody did anything except for run this thing. It was a miracle to get 50,000 a week. And he wouldn't consider it fixed until it did the 50,000 a week. So even though we were producing cassettes for months and months, like I want to say in like, end of September, October-ish, we were cranking out cassettes on a regular basis. We'd do 40,000, we'd do 25, but we could never do 50,000. We could never do 50,000. And um, and he wouldn't say that everything was fixed until we did that 50,000. Right. And Thanksgiving of 1990, that week in Scientology, uh, the weekends on Thursday, that Thursday of Thanksgiving in 1990, we produced f over 50,000 cassettes. And David Miscavige, like, had a big, made a big deal out of it. And the whole base was in these things called lower conditions, which is like a punishment zone. We had a, fl we had a flood in August, and it destroyed a ton of the property. Right. And he assigned everybody on that property that was a Sea Org member. He assigned them... a a condition of confusion, which is the lowest possible condition you can be in, in in Scientology. In order to get up out of the conditions, you have to do these things called formula, and people have to approve it and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, but in Thanksgiving of 1990, we produced 50,000 cassettes, and then w the whole entire property was um, approved to be not in lower conditions. So that's how big of a deal this little area with like 10 people in it is, is the entire property was being punished because we could not make 50,000 cassettes in a week. And the most ridiculous thing at the, in the end of all this is that they sold about 1,000 cassettes a week the entire <laughs> time I was there. So we were, we, we were you stocking think, shelves. You think those dudes before us they wasted $300,000 because the cassettes were bad. We produced millions of cassettes that were never sold. Right. And they had to trash them in the end because uh, this the entire t thing is taking place in 1990. CDs had been out CDs for a decade. Out. Yeah. A decade CDs had been around, and these guys are, we're, we're basically like hot rodding Model A's, okay? Yes. <laughs> we're hot rodding Model A's, like, you know, you can go just buy a Dodge Charger for a lot less time and money, and you'll be go faster than that Model A. Yeah, and that's, that's the insanity of David Miscavige, is like, he always was, you know, 
way behind the times of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> CDs were just happening and we're trying to put out these TDK metal tapes. As a matter of fact, the photographs that I showed you yeah. of the Gauss line, this equipment here, yeah. this equipment here, I, I showed this stuff to you, right? Yeah. These photos, when I found them, I had to look them up on Google. They yeah. came from the Museum of Magnetic <laughs> yes. Recording. They don't yes. even use them anymore. No. Even when we were doing all this, it was sort of like, what are you guys up to like you could have a c you could have a cd oh and that's the other thing these things cost a dollar to produce they're selling them for 75 dollars each these lectures that's about the average cost of an l ron hubbard cassette or lecture it's about 75 dollars um you can produce a cd for less than a penny and yeah, and, the, and the thing and is, is that Miscavige had a CD player in his officer's lounge. It was the top of the line, state of the art CD player in his officer's lounge on his personal stereo. Yeah, and he I was remember using those. those, right? those he was it was those tech. Those, like it was those technique ones where the top popped up and you would place it. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, this dude. I mean, everything's on the internet now. You can yeah. you can watch anything you want on a computer, phone, tablet. This dude just bought a TV studio. He just bought an uh, like a TV station a few well, like, years about, ago. Like, about, dude, the, what's the, wrong with you? Left, after we left, you were still there. They built a film lab, yes. obviously, because because they didn't want to, you know, rush, sending everything to Los Angeles for the rushes to be printed and brought back. And then they were like, we're going to film color separate. I, I remember the planning before oh, this yeah. was built to save L. Ron Hubbard's crappy films. Yeah, we're going to separate. So they built a state of the art film laboratory for millions of dollars on that property. And they don't even shoot on film anymore. They're, yeah. they're using digital no. cameras and stuff like that. It's a complete waste. Well, even the fact that we did, I mean, we spent millions and millions of dollars on producing these cassettes, yeah. which I'm going to say 90% of it was waste. Like the, when we would make these sets of lectures, we would produce like, let's say a, a L. Ron Hubbard lecture set has 20 lectures in it. So that's 20 cassettes. We have a binder that holds 10 cassettes on this side, then 10 cassettes on this side, and a big, thick transcript of all the lectures and a glossary and all this stuff. They were packaged very nicely. Yeah, but now here's a key thing. A lot of Scientologists don't know this, and I bet you if they knew this, they'd be like, what? When we produce those lecture sets, you know how many we would produce? We would produce 1,500. That was the amount we would produce. 1500 Scientology is saying they have 10 million members. And when they have an international release of a lecture thing, we've produced 1500 copies of that lecture series. And sometimes we go wild and we produce 5,000 and they'd sell 300. And then those 4,700 would just sit around and or they'd sell them to the Scientology organizations like they'd say that 1500 they would divide that into all the Scientology so like this organization has to buy five and this one has to buy six and this one has to buy ten and so they'd suck up uh, that 1500 and then we would produce another 1500 so we had some in case they needed some more and um a lot of times we'd never run out of that second batch of 1500 like the, they wouldn't have sold the first batch and maybe one or two ones here or there would uh order new ones so it was well, it was sort of like david miscavige picked that fifty thousand figure based on I mean, how I much the there. machine could make not how much his machine could sell and that is actually how he does everything he says oh well we can't get scientology to expand because the organizations organizations are crappy and they're in a strip mall or whatever and they may be pumping 100 people through that little strip mall location a week and so they raise 10 million dollars 20 years later they're in this big giant x museum of a facility and they're pumping 
10 people through a week now. And you're like, you would have been better off in the strip mall next to the uh, next to the dog groomer. You were doing just fine back then. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, it wasn't just it wasn't just Miscavige. L. Ron Hubbard also was a complete audiophile, if you will. Well, okay? yeah, all the equipment and the production lines at Golden Era Productions audio wise. I oversaw and had to set up. I had no background in it whatsoever, but I got people like Gary Lou and uh, John Horowitz and Steve Marlowe and all these Ken Mortensen, these people yeah. to set these things up. Why? And Hubbard, oh, really high quality. And they were really high quality, but they wasted millions of dollars on this stuff, right? He produced this album. It's one of the crappiest albums or music you've ever heard in your life called the power of source the apollo stars and that's him over there sitting next to dan arbach uh recording the stuff and miscavige yeah. was the same way he had miscavige had to have what a couple hundred thousand dollar personal stereo qc line in his officers oh, lounge, right he has that in every single country right and and every single location yeah, no, that he we has. Had to, we had to set that stuff up. It was ridiculous, you know. Yeah, he has. Dave, I want to say David Miscavige has over ten million dollars of personal office equipment Audio between gear. his various offices, just in terms of the equipment to just play back cassettes or play back CDs or play back a DVD. He might have. He might have a two hundred thousand uh, dollar speaker system in that office and that's not the that's not the um the tape player and the cassette and the t no i'm just talking about the amps and the speakers that's 200k per office and he's when got uk the free winds rtc yeah. osa or hgb asi l cadiz sp or uh sptv kcet or whatever they call the SMP, Scientology Media Productions. Anyway, he has, um, he, and this is sort of like his hobby horse in Scientology yeah, Mark, and the Sea Org. Mark, you don't know this, but one of the things, one of our duties was if mm -hmm. he was going to the officer's lounge, we would have to go down there 15 to 20 minutes before to turn on the amps because there were tube amps because they had to heat up. They need to he warm up. Listen to these things. Yeah. So that was one thing. Uh, he's going to go down to the officers' lounge. We've got to go down and turn on those amplifiers. Did they have were those manlies back then? Yes. 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 Yeah. No, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. And that guy, um, yeah, that's a whole nother story. Well, I, could I could literally tell you, I could literally tell you ten hours of stories just about the manly equipment and how yeah. Scientology reverse engineered and ripped off manly and made their own copycat stuff. Yeah. And, but regardless, um, yeah, it was ridiculous. And even to this day, like they just bought a TV station and they bought, have a TV channel on direct TV yeah. that is just playing videos that they have on their website. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and I don't know how much they're paying DirecTV for that. And Scientology is not getting anybody into Scientology through their DirecTV channel. Um, and if they are, it's not worth a million dollars a person that they're getting in. Let, let me, I want to move on just because we're getting, uh, we're moving along here. I wanted yeah. to talk to you a little bit more about your book because like Absolutely. I said, I listened to your book on audio, okay? I read your book when it first came out in 2008 or nine, whenever it was, it was fantastic, yeah. but I, you know, Thank I you. want to refresh myself. So I saw, Oh, it's on audio. So this summer I got it. And you actually, the thing I love about audio books and I listen yeah. to in the car all the time is because it's like, you're sitting in the front seat with me telling me these stories and you did an yeah. awesome job recording the book. But I wanted to ask you even before that in yeah. writing the book, okay, yeah. you, you didn't even complete high school. Did you write this book all by yourself or did you have somebody help you? Because well, it's so well written. I just want to compliment you on how well written I appreciate Home it. for Good is. Well, and that's sort of, that was my main hang up on doing the book was that I'm like, I'm pretty sure if you want to write a book, you should have at least read a book. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, I've read like, you know, Call the Wild uh, or, you know, like White Fang or something, but I've, I'm not a real, I just, 
I just didn't uh, read a lot. And um, and what the what little I did read was Hubbard because that's you have to in the C organization. Right. And and I've read a lot of equipment manuals. I sort of I I I don't exactly know how to explain it, but I have some form of a photographic memory. So if I'm reading something, as long as I just see the page, then I I'm good. I don't have to sit there and go through all of it. I just like chink, chink. It's kind of like I'm just scanning it. And so that's the sort of thing I would do with equipment manuals and stuff like So I could just scan through the whole thing and be like, okay, good, I know, like the matrix. You just flip through it and you're like, okay, good, I know how to work this. And then I just, and that's what I did with all that equipment at Golden Air Productions. Yeah, because it's not easy stuff to read those manuals. No. And you and obviously it, duplicated it because you know how to do everything with it. Yeah, you know? I had to use the equipment. So I couldn't, it wasn't like one of those things like you could fake it. I had to no, use it all no day, every day. There's no yeah. version of it. And the other thing is no one at Golden, when I got that equipment to do the quality control, no one at Golden Air Productions had ever read that manual before. So, right. um, so even when I read it, I was like, okay, when you, in Scientology, you have to read a manual, then you have to get a checkout. Somebody else right. who's read the manual has, I couldn't get a checkout because nobody had ever read nobody it. So it, it was yeah. like, it was sort of a weird thing. Like, Hey, did you get a checkout? I'd be like, no, I can't get one. And they're like, why not? And we go, no one's read it. Nobody's and read then they would be like, and every person that tried to read it would end up just buried in a dictionary for two days. And they were like, I, if you know how to use it, you know how to use it. <laughs> um, anyway, but um, so when I wrote the book, it was a lot of uh, the idea was all these things that I had posted on the Internet for four years. Right. We would take those and then just make them into a book. And every time I would look at one of those, I would be like, well, I only wrote that because I was putting it on the Internet. I could I would make it longer if I would tell the whole story, what happened before, what led up. And so then I, I just said, you know what? And Claire and I had discussed it and she said, I'll figure out how to make the book. You just write it. Okay. And I was like, okay. And she had a book like, you know, how to self publish a book or, you know, how to do this or, and so I'm just writing away. I just, I was like, I'm going to start at the beginning when we moved to California, when I was a little kid, when I was five or whatever it was. Yeah. And I'm just going to go up to the, when we got out and it was about a thousand pages. It was just the whole thing. And then she, she's reading these books and she goes, yeah, it can't be more than 400 pages. I was like, what? She goes, yeah, your first book needs to be less than 400 pages. And um, I was like, well, okay. So we took out, we threw away half the book yeah, to make it into whatever it is. It's like 398 pages. I don't even have a copy of it right here. But either way, um, I would go back in my, we lived in Burbank. Um, and we had, um, a house and in the back of the house, there was like a little, uh, like a garage that had been turned into an office and in there, um, and it, and it, um, had a little studio, little recording studio. And that was my office. And then Claire had what would be like the, um, the machine room or the equipment room where the mix board right. and everything would be. And I was in the vocal booth and, um, and that was my office. And so I would just go back in my office and I would just, every night when I got home from work, kind of like we, I do now, I would get I'd do my day, do my day work, do my job, my day job. And then when I get home, have dinner with Claire and the kids. And then I'd go back into my office and I'd crank out a chapter. And I just did that every single day. Every day. Yeah. And every day I would just write a chapter. And sometimes I'd write three or four chapters. Like I'd stay up until eight o'clock in the morning. I'd just be like, You'd be on a roll. Because, well, because once you're back in that world, yeah. it's easy. And for me, because I, I'm, when I'm, when I'm remembering something, I'm just playing back a video in my head that happened. So I can remember almost all the dialogue and I can I just, I just go back, just transport myself back to that time or back to when this happened or what that happened. And, and I can just sit there and download that into words. I can 
just keep going over it and writing. Oh yeah, then didn't this, who was that? Oh, that was John Stumpke. And I would, and I don't know why I remember the names and I don't know why I remember faces and what people I said. I do too, I do too, yeah, yeah. But for some weird reason, or for some, when I did this, um, up until 2009, I would have nightmares, like routine nightmares from yeah. uh, getting, 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 like just waking up back there, or I'm in the supermarket and David Miscavige is pushing a cart with my kids and he's like, ah, you lost the kids. You know, just weird, yeah. just like, and I would have them so much that I wouldn't sleep because I know if I fall asleep, I'm gonna have these weird nightmares. And then I would get, I would get kind of depressed or just, just out of sorts. And it was just a weird time. And when I finished writing the book, I stopped having the nightmares. And I thought that's the weirdest thing in the world that just writing it made the nightmare stop. And so then I thought, Hmm. There's something to this for me that makes it so that I don't have the nightmares. And I thought, what would, how weird would it be if somebody else that was having some weird problem read my thing and somehow it could help them? And I, and I was like, oh yeah, I totally got to do this. I, I, like, I wasn't even still sure that I was going to do the book, but somehow that there was something to all this. And then Claire, Claire got the ISBNs and the design and um, and after I had written it all and sort of got it down to like 500 pages or something, um, a guy by the name of Dan Kuhn. Yeah, I know Dan that. Kuhn sure. used to be at the Ent Base. And he, um, funnily enough, he edited a lot of the books that are now the L. Ron Hubbard books that you see. Right that they have he was the one who edited the he edited it l run hubbard and made it into those um these scientology books i thought how funny would it be if i got that dude to edit my book because he edited the l run hubbard books and then right. the person who designed my book it's the same person who designed all the scientology books jeff hawkins right <laughs> no jeff hawkins did oh. some um stuff for us but not oh, okay. that he jeff hawkins was more like a marketing guy he did do some designs of some books, but the guy who did like the typesetting and the layout and stuff like that, um, his name was Kalahiki. Kalahiki is the one who did the design and the he did the cover art and the you know yeah. the the cover and then the uh, slipcase and the typesetting and all that stuff. And so um, yeah, he took um, he read the book. And after he read the book, he made that the cover from the chapter. It starts out where they're chasing me right. the day of my escape from Scientology. I'm driving down the highway on a motorcycle and they're chasing me with a Nissan Pathfinder SUV and they run me off the road while we're driving down the road. And so he wrote that, he drew that, he did, he, he he took some artistic license on the motorcycle that's not exactly how my yamaha tw 200 200 looks in real life but i was like it's a cover of a book let him be but the funny thing is is the picture of the suv is from a picture of that suv right. the scientology sea org uh security S suv that is that actual suv um, but, um, so the guy that, um, edited L. Ron Hubbard's books, edited it, the guy who designed and did the typesetting and the, all that, the glossary and all that, mm -hmm. he did it. And then, um, and then we had a friend of mine that used to work at the Ent base and his wife was like a real estate agent and she was going to college to get her master's and something. And I said, Hey, can you do me a favor and read this? It had already been gone through by Dan and then it was gone through by her. And I said, could you read this and tell me what you think? And for the most part, she was like, it's amazing. I really like it. 
There's a lot of lingo, a lot of lingo in there. Right. And so I was like, yeah. And I always kind of thought that doing a glossary was like a Scientology type thing. And then I realized, well, yeah, because they're tr they're talking, they're using so much lingo that you can't even understand what's going on without a glossary. Right, right. And to some extent, there is a bit of that in there. So we added a glossary and yeah. it was sort of like, oh, this ha is helpful. And then um, the only other thing that she said was it was hard to kind of picture where some of the things were and stuff like that. Just so I was like, OK. And so we didn't take out the lingo. And the reason I didn't want to take out the lingo was because the people that I want to read, the, the there's two people that I want to read the book, people that are in Scientology and people that are maybe yeah. thinking or interested in getting into Scientology. Right. And then if you're just somebody who wants to know about crazy shit, then you can read it too. But it's really yeah. for those two people. I want to inoculate anyone who's like having some ideas, like maybe yeah. this is a good one. Maybe, yeah, read this and then maybe think about it. Um, and then if somebody was in Scientology, if they read it, because in Scientology, there's a lot of stuff that happens, whether you're in the Sea Org or whether you're a civilian Scientologist, there's a lot of things that happen and they don't tell you. Like, you no, know, the left you know, hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. All yeah, but you time. know something happened yeah. with somebody. Right, but you don't know why. But you don't know why. And when you ask, you're either going to get in trouble for asking because you really, right. who cares what happened to that guy? That's nothing to do with to you. Ask about yeah, that. you don't have the rank to ask where's Shelly. Um, but then, even if they're just like, I want to know about this place called the Int Base or the International Headquarters or Golden Era or whatever, there you can't find out what goes on there. You, there's no place that tells you that. And for me, I was like. The worst I could be doing is just, just documenting it. Like it happened, here it is, this is my story. And if somebody, if it helps somebody by reading it or they get some questions answered, or maybe they have a relative that works at this place, and I might talk about them in the book, which was the case for at least, I wanna say 10 people wrote me saying, hey, I just read your book, Linnea is this, or yeah. um, Lyman Spurlock is my cousin or you know what whatever yeah um and so we i've got a we lot get of that those. on our channel we get that on our channel totally we tell stories There's, the historical stuff and people go oh that's my brother or that's my we yeah. Get that. yeah it's kind of weird that that person will find out more about their relative from us than from yeah, their than relative from them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, the um, other thing I was going to say is that, you know, you, you, what you're doing, I mean, what you were talking about earlier about, you know, the nightmares, stuff like that, we call it peeling the onion on our channel, which, by yeah. the way, people subscribe to our channel, Scientology peeling the onion. I'm just joking. But anyway, but no, I mean, it, it you you get rid of it. You know what I mean? It goes away, goes away yeah. just because you've been looking at it. And it's it's very helpful. And reading your book has the same effect. You know what I mean? I had well, the same thing with Barefaced Messiah um, yeah. written by Russell Miller. I, it completely changed my point of view on things. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. I the, the When I re, when I watched the South Park episode, mm -hmm. I want to say that um, sort of deprogrammed me from the Scientology aspect. Like, I know those guys are bullshit from watching South Park. Because I go, <laughs> I was there. And I know what happened, but then right. when I see the South Park episode, and the, and they tell the OT three secret Xenu and body yeah. thetans and all that, I'm like, that's the thing they were not telling us. That was right. it. Like I was sort of like, oh, this is a bunch of bullshit. And also, um, at the Imp base, there are people that are OT eight. At the Imp base, they have them. That's the highest operating thetan level you can achieve in scientology and these people couldn't organize themselves out of a wet, wet paper bag <laughs> and i'm haven't even read dynamics i could run the circles around these people oh, yeah. in my sleep i could yeah. run circles around these guys so when i found out 
Like that always never made sense to me. Like right. I don't want to become that. So mm -hmm. it was never really, um, I never really thought that doing the OT levels was going to make me better because those guys had already done it and I'm already I'm better right than now. them. I'm better exactly. right now. And I don't know anything about Scientology. Right. So how, I, and I, so I almost thought like whatever they're doing, they're making people worse. They're not making them better. They're certainly, maybe they're not making them worse. Maybe those people were flat ball bearings before and now they're just maybe a little rounded, <laughs> but, yeah. but the fact that it wasn't, I'd never met an OTA that I was like, that guy's a rock well, star. Yeah, exactly. That guy is amazing. Um, and even if you go like, there was, I want to say maybe there was 10 of these OT8s that are at the property, all 10 of them, just not impressed at all, right. all 10, every single one of them. And then there were maybe a hundred people that were OT6 or OT7 or OT5. And those guys were okay, but still like, you know, the sun's not shining out of their backside. They're not wrong stars. They might be capable people, but nothing like, I'm not sure that's what made them that. So when I, when I saw the South Park episode, that sort of was like, oh, I get it. That the, the thing those guys learned about was this. They learned yeah. about the, the space cooties. How is learning about space cooties supposed to help you out in the real yeah. world? I mean, if you're fighting space cooties, sure, good to be educated. But yeah. if you're not, it's sort of like that's useless information for, for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, so... Either way, when I wrote the book, I thought if you could just answer people's questions about this, like they're gonna, they're gonna know this is what happened to this guy who did it. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a different outcome for other people, but this guy, it didn't work out too good for him. And, um, and I've done fine since I left Scientology. I, I really don't feel like the first few years was sort of like it was it was it was hard but i had scientology on my back the whole time Darn, and it was yeah. hard so then i thought if i can slay if i can like just kill kill it and just do amazing in the real world and i've got those guys trying to push me down the whole time i'm like imagine if they weren't how right. amazing I could be doing. So I was sort of like, yeah, I don't need them. I don't care what they do. I don't, you, you just ignore them. And every time I try to not mess with them, like there's been many times where I'm just like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm sick of talking yeah. about Scientology. And I would, and I had sort of announced that to a lot of people like Mike and, um, just people we knew. I was just like, I'm doing my thing. I'm killing it in my yeah. in my Is industry, it? and I'm doing amazing projects, and I'm I'm getting more and more and more and more of them. And the less I have to do with this Scientology stuff, the better for me professionally. So um, let me ask that, you. I, I, I yeah. was going to show you this picture because yeah. it just kind of fits in with the peer what you're talking about here, right? What did you think about when you saw this picture? Well, okay, I thought that's pretty good. Um, but to be Everybody, fair, that's, that's Leah Remini, okay? Yeah, she was doing a show called Dancing with the Stars. And, and where they do these rehearsals. She's um, holding one of a copy of Mark's book, and this is a paparazzi yeah. photo. Yeah, and this is when she first was getting out of Scientology. And um, I'm trying to say this without not giving any, regardless, she hadn't yet done anything or wrote a book or said anything. She w it was just kind of like rumblings that I think Leah left Scientology. And um, that was sort of what was going around. And she called me, she, no, she didn't call me. She had, she talked to somebody else 
and that person was calling me and was asking me all these questions. And it wasn't somebody, somebody that I would normally talk to or that I even really knew, but they were a very, very famous Scientologist. Mm -hmm. And that person was asking me questions and I was sort of like, wow, this is really weird. Why is this person talking to me? And also, why are they asking me these things? And then at a certain point, they were like, oh, I'm going to send this to somebody and they're, they're going to probably end up calling you. And I was like, okay. And, and again, I don't really have a big weird thing with celebrities because Tom Cruise was auditing me and Nicole Kidman right. was there. And also, I grew up in Hollywood. So I'm sort of like, yeah, they're just doing a job. They're not, they're, they're, they're taking shits on the same toilet you're taking shits on. It's just a person. Anyway, um, so then when Leah finally did call me, I'm like, oh, I'm going to send you a copy of my book. And then I thought, oh, no, I'm going to send it to you. I'm going to send you multiple copies. And I told her, I said, hey, throw, throw, throw our brother a bone. And maybe, you know, walk or go to the Ivy and have Ivy's like a famous restaurant in, in L.A. where Scientology right. uh, celebrities, celebrities used to be. Celebrities hang out, yeah. Paparazzi hang the out paparazzi there. Paparazzi outside, right. Um, I don't even know if it's still a thing. but uh, It is. It is. Go ahead. I was like, maybe you can go to the Ivy and just have a copy of my book sitting on the table or something like that. And uh, she laughed and I thought, okay, well, whatever. Anyway, and then all of a sudden, somebody sends me a message like, dude, I just looked on TMZ and there's a copy of Leo with your book. And I was just like, nice. Um, anyway, but the book had been out for, you know, years and years and years by the time she did that. And, um, but, I, but she, it's hadn't, good. she I, hadn't read it. She hadn't really read it yet though. Had she, or, or, um, I don't actually know. I don't think I'm pretty sure she read it. And the funny thing about I, I Leah, would imagine, I would imagine that it really opened her eyes. Cause no, somebody like her wouldn't know what was happening at the international base. No. You paint that picture so well in the book that it had to be really eye opening for her. Yeah, and 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 I also talked about Ray Midoff and Mark Ingber and Mark Yeager and David Miscavige. So if you were in Scientology and you were a celebrity, you knew who I was talking about. So and also it's very uh, nuts and bolts. My book, you know, you think we talked about all that boring audio stuff in here? There's a lot of boring audio stuff in there too because I'm just telling you this is what I know. This is what I did. Yeah. This is how it went down. This is the equipment I used. And I'm just like rattling it off. People are like, we don't care that it was a Hewlett Packard 400 FL. Right. It could have been just, you could have just said uh, analyzer. Um, anyway, but, uh, but the, but the I funny understood, though. Yes. The funny thing about Leah was that when she was talking to me, she was like, well, why didn't you write a knowledge report? And that's off policy. And, and I, I was like, Leah, you you're, you're, so, you're so naive. I was like, all that, oh, write a KR. That's for you as a Scientologist. It's a do as we say, not as we do. At the international headquarters, they don't give a shit about L. Ron Hubbard policy. It's like, whatever, we're trying to get shit done. That is not going to help. <laughs> Doing all that old fuddy duddies nonsense just slows shit down. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, increase production usually. Uh, let me show you one more uh, picture. And also, I want to ask yeah. you another question, for, too. The, the first thing I want to ask you a question about from your book, and then I want to show you this picture. Um, you know, you tell the story about Miscavige hitting you, right? And did he yeah. knock your glasses off or whatever? I get asked this question all the time when he, when I, because he physically attacked me. Yeah. Uh, they always ask, why didn't you fight back? I get asked that all the time. Well, and I tell in the case why, of you, I'd like to get you. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the case of me, he did hit me. He was he was literally just like wailing on yeah. me. He was so mad at me, <laughs> and uh, he's punching me. And I did have glasses at the time. Um, I would always say this: I had glasses at the time. Well, now I've got glasses again. So whatever, <laughs> my LASIK finally wore off. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Anyway, so he punched me in the face several times. And when he did that, my glasses actually got broken. So they kind of, they broke. And I think one of the lenses popped out or something like that. But I picked up my glasses, kind of like shook myself off. And, and it, was in a, it was in that finishing area is where this took place. Where So right as you walk through those swinging red doors from the Gauss line to go into finishing, it was right there on the other side of those doors. And we were in finishing and he... Um, had ordered me months and months before to get this area uh, rebuilt. And he said, um, how much is it going to be to rebuild? And I want a whole proposal. And I spent weeks and weeks with Russ Bellin from the Church of Spiritual Technology and Tom DeVocht, who was pricing all the construction. And we came up with what it was going to take. It was going to cost $5 million. And he was like, you are unbelievable. It's just toys, toys, toys. You just want to buy this and you want to buy that. And I got taken off post. I was the producer gold and I got taken off post. He, he right. demoted me and he made me the director of audiovisual manufacturing, which is the post over the area that I was supposed to redesign and get rebuilt. Yeah, right. So instead of being the producer over all of Goldner Productions, he made me the head of the department that I had failed to design and rebuild Properly, for $5 million. Yeah. That was unacceptable. Okay, well, uh, there was months in between the demotion and this day. Fast forward, many, many months later, um, David Miscavige, when I failed the design proposal, because I gave him one for $5 million, he himself did the design according to him and um he but it took him like a year and for me to produce the amount of lectures and printed materials and cds and dvds that he had listed in order to do it in the time frame that he wanted those machines i did the same thing he did with the gauss line how much what's the throughput of these machines and what's the time frame that that you know, how many days, if it works, will it take to produce that list? And and then you just make the equipment numbers match that. So if you need 10 copy machines to do that, and each machine costs $100,000, okay, you need a million dollars in printers right. or whatever it was. Anyway, he took a year doing his design, and then he spent $10 million on equipment. Double weight double what you were going to He say. doubled it. Well, because he wasted a year of time not right. doing my design. So right. instead of getting $5 million of equipment to produce it in two years, he bought $20 million of equipment to produce it in one year. And we were at the end of that year of getting all this stuff um, put together. And so he, when we were walking, it was we were almost done with everything with all the printers and the new packaging and shrink wrappers and all this stuff. And as we're walking it through, he, he made this comment, which is like, yeah, this is how you do it. And I was like, you motherfucker, <laughs> this is how you do it. Yeah. If you fuck around for a year or two and you double the budget, yeah, this is how you do it. And I sort of said that under my breath. Like I was so yeah. like, are you really kidding me right now? Yeah. Like that's your story. Like, this is how yeah. you do it. You just doubled my proposal. <laughs> What are we? What world do we live in? Anyway, so I was like, well, yeah. I, I think what I said was, well, yeah. You spend twice as much, you can get it done in half as much time. And um, and he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, bitch. What do you? What? We're, this is not a rocket science. And that's when he punched me. And so he started punching me, and um, and so I picked up my glasses. I kind of dusted myself off, and I was like. Let's go. And when I did that, when I was like, let's do it, um, he fucking freaked out. And Greg Wilhair, and I can't remember who the other person was. It might have been um, Carlo Russo or Mike Sutter or somebody. Just 
two dudes just picked me up and just they carried me. Greg Greg Wilhair is probably six foot something. He's a big yeah, guy. Yeah. He's not short. He used to be a quarterback. No, he, yeah, know. he used to be a quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. So the him. Villanova University, yeah. Yeah. So him and this other dude just picked me up and they just brought me outside. <laughs> and, 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 and as they were bringing me out, he looked to Larice and Shelly and said, did you see that? That guy was going to punch me. And I, as they're carrying me out, I was like, damn straight, Skippy. Like, I was like, fucking A, I was. You just yeah. punched me, bitch, for saying the exact thing that you did. Right. And so when that happened, and then I was pissed. I was literally like, you know how when you do something in the Sea Org and you know you overreact, and then you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you know, I whatever. Did, yeah. You you knew right. you did something you should have done. You're like, yeah, I'm a dick. I shouldn't have. I wasn't like that. I was like, no, no, he's the dick, not me. He's 100% the dick. And that was not a good thing to do. <laughs> because at that point, I was essentially, he knew that I didn't give a fuck. Right. And I've never myself seen somebody go like, let's do this. Right. So I was like, eh, yeah, if you if you're in the if you work for the Pope and you get in a fight with the Pope, probably not going to be working with the Pope anymore. <laughs> no, and it's, and it's pretty. And it's actually if you really believe he's the Pope, which which would be you know, you're working for him and all that. It's it's difficult. It's actually it actually is upsetting. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the and the the thing that's funny is that I knew no one had done it because he looked to them and said, Did you see that? That guy was gonna punch me back. And it was like, Yeah, that's how fights work in the real world, bitch. <laughs> you yeah, can't... And that's what I tell people. <laughs> it's just I didn't fight back number one because he always had an entourage. Like there were ten yeah. people or five people around him. So I knew if I fought back, they would just pummel me or whatever. But the other reason I didn't do it is because I wanted them to all see how crazy he was because he had never done that before. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He'd never physically attacked, particularly somebody who worked for him, yeah. you know, for years in front of all these staff members. There were gold staff members and stuff. And I wanted them to see how crazy he was, you know? Yeah. And I remember when I, and I wrote about it in my book. Yeah, you were there. I, I was there when he did that thing to you. And similarly he had those two security guards with him mark yeah. yeager was there so there was three other dudes there so yeah. if you if if it was you on dave oh mark's gonna kick dave's ass yeah it's bigger, it's bigger than he was yeah yeah much bigger and also yeah. you were um you were stocky you were like big boned you were like oh i'm gonna yeah you, he's gonna get hurt um but there I was the three opposite. I collapsed but, down. And yeah, you were just like, he was just yeah. hitting you and you, you were just ground. like, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I remember that he took his glasses off. That's how I knew. Like he, Sunglasses? Yeah. he planned it to the, yeah. like you were, you were there. He walked in with those guys and he took his sunglasses off and he handed them to the guy next to him. And I was like, oh, he's fixing to do, do something. This is not just like, like I, I was of the impression he came there to do that. And when you were just being lippy, I think you wouldn't yeah, call him. I talked back to him for the first time. No, I talked yeah. back to him. And, but the best part is, is you called him Dave. Yep. You didn't say, sir. You didn't say no. COB. You didn't say Mr. Miscavige. He was like, what are you going to do, Mark? What, 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 what you, what, how are we, how are we going to deal with this? And you're like, I don't know, Dave, what do you want to do? And I was like, oh this is going down like he came there to fight and you were like yeah what's up yeah, bitch and, and the crazy <laughs> thing was i was on a scissors lift up high yes painting pipe, so i'm talking down to him yeah. and immediately after i talked back to him he's like get down off of that yeah. lift so i came and, down got off and then he went at me you know? yeah and it was sort of one of those things where i was just sweeping over in the corner <laughs> you were just arrived. and i was like out time to be invisible <laughs> and i was just like <laughs> just watching this all go down in the corner yeah. not like a statue just like 
they're I, no one no one see me i'm invisible i'm invisible yeah <laughs> and, and I, um, I, had had a, I had had enough i mean like yeah literally you had just arrived i've been putting yeah. up with this crap for six and a half years it took and me I've known him since he was yeah. 16. You know? yeah it took me 14 years from that time i saw him to hit you yeah. took him 14 years before he got to the point where like I'm going to gut this guy. And also, that was another thing I wanted to say. The whole time I was there when I knew Dave when I first got there, I was a teenager. So right. I was a, I was like a little, little scrawny guy. guy. So it would be, it was almost unthinkable that that would happen to me in 1990. But in 2004, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm like 30, yeah, 30, I'm, I'm, 30 years yeah. old or something at then. So it's like, okay, that's a little, a little I'm closer. bigger. Yeah, I was 31. So it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. I was, anyway. well, 94. I was 31 too. Yeah. Cause it was 94. Yeah. I was born in 73. So yeah. Or maybe I had not turned either way. Um, but um, yeah, David Miscavige, um, he only has the power because he has these um, entourage or right. these, or also, even if you just get into a one-on-one argument with him, with him, and you guys have a disagreement, well, you're just going to get interrogated for the next five months <laughs> by other people. So even if they're not there with him, he can inflict pain and suffering yeah. on you by many, many other means that oh, yeah. you would sort of like, I got to play nice with this guy. Cause, and also by between 1990 in 2004 he became increasingly and and more increasingly violent and yeah, erratic exactly. and psychotic and you know well that's why so, i tell people we saw we saw it that you wouldn't have known because you just got there but exactly. i had dealt with it and seen him going spinnier and crazier and crazier to the, and and most staff did not see that i worked yeah. with them every day so i could see it and that's when i went i'm this is done if i get my wife to leave with me i'm leaving and then I came yeah. back because like, she wouldn't leave with me. And then I finally just put my foot down and went, I'm out of here. You know, I, I said, I'll be here with the cops if you don't give me my stuff and I'm gone. And that's when they let me go. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. You don't realize you think when you're in the Sea Org, you think um, the Sea Org holds all the cards. If you know you can leave. And if they won't let you leave, you're like, oh, I'm just going to call police. Oh, they'll, they'll let you. They won't. They won't oh, touch yeah, you. They, were like, they will no, literally no, 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 no. let you yeah. walk away and you say, get my stuff ready. I'm coming back with the police tomorrow. They'll do it because they know they can't stop you from doing that. And I wish I wish I would have known that when I was there because I'm here well, escaping on a motorcycle and as yeah. soon as the cops get involved they're like up oh, he's gone <laughs> i was like well and oh, you wouldn't know I because you were it. you were a teenager you didn't even have you weren't even educated like on your civil rights probably yeah. in the constitution no. you know what i mean it's like all sorts of things that they violate but had no idea you know yeah and i think that's one of the reasons why <clears throat> scientologists frown on a formal education because you're going to learn about all the stuff that they can't do to you if you get a proper formal education <laughs> you'll be like that's illegal you'll be like oh really i didn't know that <laughs> i grew okay, up in I there <laughs> I got one last photo I want to show you, then we'll, we'll answer questions, everybody. Perfect. So, and this, we don't have a lot, but we have some questions, so we'll do okay. that. But I want to show you this photo. You came to visit, uh, you were here for a convention in Las Vegas a few years ago. And, oh, yeah. Uh, we went out to dinner. You invited me to go with you to the Hard Rock and all that. Anyway, yes. you said, you said, Oh, let's drive by the new Las Vegas ideal organization. <laughs> yeah. He goes, let's they go had see just what we can they had just, just built this recently yeah yeah they had just built this said, brand new organization and it was in the middle of nowhere. nowhere the worst place you could be anyway and you go oh i'm gonna go in there and take a picture i, I do <laughs> yeah. this all the time i was scared i was chicken you know what i was scared I said, no, <laughs> yeah no, i don't want to do that it was so anyway, funny here, here's the picture you got a I staff member to take that picture right I got the person at the reception desk to take the picture. I would do this all the time. I would just go if I was in a city. Um, I and there was a new one of these ideal Scientology organizations, I, yeah. and it says it says right outside, "Everybody welcome." So I'm yeah. like, "Oh, I'm part of everybody." <laughs> and then whenever I would go in there, I'd be like, "Oh, yeah, I was at Flag, and I did this," and they'd be like, "Oh," and I'd be like, "Could you take a picture of me real quick?" 
And um, every time I have one of me in Denver, I have one of me in Boston, at Las Vegas. Anytime I went anywhere, I just get, I would do it. And then I think, I can't remember who, I think Claire told me, yeah, don't do that anymore. <laughs> I was like, why? And she's like, I just don't like it. I just, I'm not comfortable with it. <laughs> And I'd be I, like, be honest, it's I, I so fun to me that I'm this big bad SP. But if you just, if I just walk into your organization, you'll take a picture of me. But if you know who I am, well, then that gives me the power to be this SP. It's a weird thing in Scientology. They attach significances to things that changes everything. And if they just didn't do that, it would, it would kind of just. I don't know. It's just weird. Well, I found I it was PTSD for me. I had a hard time walking around the complex. I mean, in, in Big Blue in, in Los Angeles. And you do it all the time and all that. But I, I did finally yeah. do it. But I was creeped out the whole time I was walking around. And the same thing. I didn't even want to go into the park. I did. I went in the parking lot of the York when you went yeah. in. I've I'm, I'm got the car going. Oh, I'm that's right. I said, hey, <laughs> that's right. We went there in you, your car. You My picked car, me up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we drove there and I was like, oh, let's go inside. And you were like, fuck that. I was like, well, we're just going to take a picture. And you were like, I am not getting out of this car and I'm going to leave it running. And when you're running out, uh, I'm going to work. It's going to you were like my getaway driver. And I was like, it's not that big of a deal. We're just going into a building. And yeah. uh, so I went in there took the pick and then i just came moseying out like yeah, yeah. Da, da. and i get in and you're like what happened i'm like oh i got him to take a picture of me at the reset and you're like what it's like yeah i do it all the time it's, it's just kind of just a thing i do oh, i so go funny. back i go back to the place where i was a prisoner for 15 years and i just have fun in the lobbies <laughs> yeah exactly anyway, but um to, yeah um, that was um, fun if you want to order Mark's book, you can purchase it at www.blownforgood.com. And it's in hardcover, paperback, audio, and Kindle versions. And the yeah. audio the audio book is read by Mark personally. And it's fantastic. If you like listening Thank you. to him here, I appreciate stuff, it. You will enjoy the book immensely. It's really, really good. It's worth, even if you've read it, get the audio book and listen to it. You're going to have a great time doing so. But you can order it there. Um, at, at his website. And they autograph too, if you want, right, Mark? Don't you guys do autograph? Books? Yeah, but all the ones we sell, if you go to the link in the description um, on our merch store, all the copies we sell are sold by myself and also Claire. Um, I did want to say that I don't do this anymore. I don't go into the organizations. Um, I haven't done it in probably <laughs> over a decade. But um, the reason why I don't encourage people to do that is because... Yeah, I don't want somebody to get in trouble or get in a weird uh, compromising position. And um, it was funny that you said that because you said you go to the complex all the time. I actually did go to the complex all the time when I lived in Los Angeles. I didn't even care. I would walk down the street, go to protest. Mm -hmm. We did this video documentary with this guy named Serge that the Aftermath Foundation oh, helped. Yeah. Awesome. And we drove over to the complex because that's where he had his accident was right there on L. Ron Hubbard Way. Mm -hmm. And um, and when we were driving around, I got a little anxious. And I was kind of like, God, I haven't, I haven't felt this in a long, this feeling of being anxious, like um, I've got to be very careful and I've got to, and, and I realized it was because I had Surge with me. And I don't know what Surge's deal is. And I don't know if, if they do something, is he going to freak out? Is he going to have a, an episode or is he gonna get violent with them and then that's where that anxious that unknown kind of comes in if they come to me and they want to mess with me i'm like dude i've i've done hey hey there's Re hey red rodriguez how you doing yeah, bud i haven't I've seen you in years <laughs> yeah when i'm at, when i'm at, in los angeles i'm up, i've already beat the boss the boss um i've already been all the way to the top and conquered that level i beat the big boss i'm right. i don't need i'm not going to be worried about a low level like a level one security guard i've been to the top sp level 15 troll david miscavige i've dealt yeah. directly with him for over a decade so a security guard in los angeles i'm sort of like i know the laws i know i'm not trespassing i'm on a public street 
you know, GTFO. We, we don't need to be having a conversation. But, um, and that's sort of the funny thing about the, the hate websites they have about us and the ads they run and all the lies they tell. It's like, dude, we worked with the main guy. He did all that to our face. Sure, right. it sucks to have that stuff about on the internet, uh, just lies and stuff about you. But if you know it's not true, Right. Then yeah, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, okay, so there's somebody in Omaha that, oh, what's who's Mark Headley? And they go, oh, who is MarkHeadley.com? That's probably going to tell me. And uh, they see that I, you know, licked a bunch of crackers. It's like, okay, I'm sorry. I had to read that, but uh, pretty sure that didn't happen. But even if it did, <laughs> that's what they got on me. On I'm me. a cracker licker. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Anyways. Anyway, we're going to do a giveaway. We've got a merch giveaway on my site. So if you want to get in the chat, we're going to give away a coffee mug right here. Our Scientology store is peeling the onion. G'day, mate. So we're going to give that away. So if you want to get in the chat, do that. But I wanted to mention as well, uh, if you like the show, please subscribe to our channel. We're at 9,000, almost 9,300 subscribers. And we nice. have a long way to go. But uh, we'd like to get to 10,000 subscribers so then we could do fundraisers and things too. So if, you, if you like this and you, you've been watching this and you haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe you, button. And as, If you and want as a mug, do you say mug life. me? In ours, mug we do me. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mug say me, book yeah. me. Do you say mug me? Mug, mug me. me yeah. Mug me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hit that like button, all that. And, of course, if you haven't subscribed to Mark's channel, which most everybody I'm sure has, please subscribe to that as well. Um, Appreciate anyway, it. Anyway, and then one other thing I wanted to mention, too, is I have a new channel that's just for fun. It's called Las Vegas Travel and More. I just started two weeks ago. I got 460 subscribers. So if you would, please subscribe to it. It's it's story places to go, things to see in Las Vegas, great places to eat. Also, we're doing videos on you know different Janice's uh, cruise voyage, things like that. But anyway, nice. subscribe at M Fisher LV at M Fisher LV. It's Las Vegas travel and more. I'd appreciate it. It's just a little fun sort of hobby channel that i put together so yeah i would really appreciate it anyway that's nice um we'll get into the chat here and do well, uh, well do you want a mug do you want to want to throw a mug at somebody first or okay. you want to wait uh, until we're done with the chat no we'll do a mug now and then we'll ask answer questions is that okay sure yeah okay so anyway this is the mug here and uh anyway if you want to get in the chat uh mark and then if you like uh you can do the countdown and then i'll just you want me to somebody. pick you know, you just randomly count down from five. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, five, four. Well, you know, I always joke around about this because some people watch on their phone. Some people watch on an Apple TV or on a smart TV. And so yeah. I'm like, yeah, let them get in there. Let them get, get, take a few minutes to get in there. Um, but sometimes we're doing... Um, we're doing a live and there could be, you know, it could be a few thousand people in there when those oh, people start get going on those comments. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, that's good enough. If you've got enough time to get in there by now, oh, I can see, I have the chop popped out on another screen here. Yeah. And, 734 uh, people are watching. Oh, wow. That's, that's great. Yeah, that's a yeah, good yeah. amount of people for just yeah, like yeah, a absolutely. Friday afternoon hang. Yeah. Anyway, so if you want to count down, I'll just randomly okay. pick somebody. You ready? Five, yep. four, three, two, and one. There you go. Ann or Ann Ortiz. Ann Ortiz. Mug me, Ann Ortiz. Congratulations, Mug me. Ann. Congratulations, I love that. Ann. Mug what me. What I'd like you to do <laughs> is send me an email, okay, to messengerondutymf <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> That's Messenger the other thing. On duty mf at gmail.com. Hold on. Let, just send me your name and your, your address where I can ship you. We'll get the mug shipped to you from Fourth Wall and you'll get it. So if you send me that email, I'd appreciate it. And congratulations. Go ahead, Mark. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, isn't it you? Um, I sent you these spy files, your spy yeah. files. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know, I have a, a whole treasure trove of internal Scientology documents that are from the Office of Special Affairs. And um, if anybody, if I saw anybody in there that had a document, then I would just send 
them the document. And for some of us, they have more than others. So I would just search the person or search what they refer to that person as. But Mark's initials are MF. So they call him MFR. Isn't that what it, your code name is? No. MFR? Mofo. Mofo. Mofo that's right. Mofo. Oh, where is it at? Here, right here. Mofo, Mofo Mark. Mark. Yeah, that's. They, I added the Mark, but they call me Mofo. That's they call my him. Code name. That was his SP code name was Mofo. Yeah, Osa. Osa, they call me Mofo. And I'm sure it was the funniest the thing. I'm I was sure like, came, I actually, you can get T-shirts. I have a yeah. T-shirt that says Mofo Mark. You yeah. This coffee, coffee mug. And go to our merch site in the description. It's just awesome. Click on there, and you can order these things. They're great. That's, I decided I'm going to embrace it. Why not? Absolutely. Hey, there's a worse. There aren't too many worse. Nicknames that I'm a mofo, absolutely. Don't mess <laughs> <Yeah>. with <me. laughs> it's so funny when I was reading. Also, uh, yeah, when I was reading the spy files that I was going to send you, I was like, "Are they just calling him a mofo, or does that his name?" And then after I saw a bunch of different ones, I'm like, "Oh no, that's his like SP code name is mofo." And I didn't know that till you send that to me. And yeah, I was like, I can under look. There's no way Kirsten, what's her name, Katano. Yeah. My, you know, there's yeah. no way she came up with that nickname. That's no. got to be from Miscavige. You yep. know what I mean? Because the, these reports are going to Miscavige. So MF, Mofo, good. Yeah. F you, you know, Mofo. Yeah. Me, you know? <laughs> it's the best. Mofo. But, that, but that's what I love about it, too. Like, they're saying that as a way to be like, push you down even more. Yeah. Even they're going to talk about, you're never going to see these documents they're writing, but they're still right. going to talk about you like you're a mofo. And the fact that you made merch out of it, to me, that's 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 what this is all about. Like, Oh, I, they, got, a, I got a t-shirt, <laughs> mofo, Mark, and then it has our, our Scientology stories, peel and the onion on this, and you can get it in eight colors. So nice. if you want one. Good job. Good job, Mark. That's the way to do it. <laughs> we took it another step, too. We we embraced the term Rock Slammer. So we got a oh, Rock yeah. Slammer t-shirt as well. So if you nice. want to be a Rock Slammer, you can get that, too. <laughs> rock Slammer. <laughs> it's the best. Okay. Anyway, so let's Good get job, some Ann. questions here real quick here. And uh, we'll Absolutely. get up here. Uh, we don't have a lot of them, so that's okay. Love Dreaming Peach. Question, is Mark from Marcus? Can you speak about Mark and Mark K versus C? LOL. As a cat, I always prefer K to C. Do you feel <laughs> this way? Ha ha. Go ahead, Mark. Mark is just Mark. My name is not Marcus. It's not uh, anything else. It's, it's just Mark. Um, I think my parents were, they were in Missouri. I think they were trying to be fancy and throw a C on it because that's the French spelling. Um, no one in my family is French. Um, I, I did I take it. French as a child because of that. But uh, no. Um, Comment vous appelez-vous? Je m'appelle Marc. Um, ah, yeah, no. Really? I'm. It's just to see. The funniest thing ever is I went to Starbucks and I said, it's Mark with a C. Uh, when I ordered. Hey, what's your name? Oh, it's Mark. And I just said, oh, with a C. And when I got my cup, it said Kark. <laughs> C-A-R-K. Kark. And I was like, well, um, got to be fair. That is Mark with a C. Just not at the right place, but that is Mark with a C. Is Kark. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I have the double whammy because I'm M-A-R-K. But yeah. my name, Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R, can also be spelled F I S with a C H E R. Yes, oh, I, exactly. So when I when I tell people like when I'm on the phone, my name is Mark Fisher, and they're typing out. I say it's M A R K F I S H E R because it gets misspelled yeah. all the time. Yeah, anyway, I'm easy. And, and there are a lot of marks in Scientology. I've, this has been Mark pointed Yeager, out to me. Mark Mark Hager, Mark Ingber, uh, Mark Fisher, Mark Hadley, Mark Swanson, Mark Swanson. Yeah. yeah. Mark Sonson, where are you? I've been looking for you. I want to talk yeah. to that dude. That dude disappeared. His name is Marcus Swanson, and he's a photographer. There is a very, very famous photographer that's done a lot of stuff for Nike, and his name is Marcus Swanson. Not the same guy. So it's hard to find a photographer named Marcus Swanson when there's another big one by the same you know name. i i I've, you know there's a reporter for the washington post from the early 90s 
and his name is Mark Fisher, spelt exactly the same as mine. And he did yeah. a story on Scientology. And I guarantee you, Miscavige probably had a heart attack when he saw the name. Really? <laughs> is it it's spelled yeah. the same way in everything? Exactly the same. He's still a reporter wow. for the Washington Post. That's amazing. You know, there's I got served in a lawsuit one time in Burbank. Mark Headley. It was with a K but everything else seemed to be legit. Um, there is a Mark Headley who is in the movie industry in Los Angeles, but he um, tends to be in the more adult entertainment industry than the, I think the lawsuit was like um, Bikini Blondes from Bay Beach was the, uh, was the, it was in regard, the lawsuit was in regards to that production or, yeah. or, you know, vampires on Bikini Beach or something like that. And I was like, I'm pretty sure this is another Mark Edley. I'm not this guy. I don't know anything about Bikini Babes uh, on Vampire Beach, but uh, it sounds fun, but uh, no. And uh, sure enough, I looked it up, and there's another Mark Headley who's rocking out uh, some, you know, low level, uh, you know, TNA picks. Absolutely. Okay. Next question here, uh, Mark. Uh, this is from Suzanne. Question, Mark. Were you the first person to speak out on YouTube? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, Tori Chrisman, Mark Bunker. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Astra Woodcraft. There was some people that were before me. YouTube um, only came out in 2005. And I actually have had a channel on YouTube, I want to say since 2008. I started one very early after YouTube started. And I would put um, the chat videos are still on the channel to this day, just these scrolling hate sites that they had had on us at the time. But um, really wasn't I think at that time I was still trying to get my life sorted out. Um, and the YouTube wasn't really that big of a platform for the Scientology. I mean, Tori was doing stuff, but there was four or 5,000 views or 10,000 views. And I was just sort of like, I'm going to go on John and Ken on KFI AM 640, and I'm going to reach 50,000 people. So I was doing that. And a lot of TV shows we did, uh, Tampa Bay Times, and I've done movies in Germany, in Denmark, Australia, Louis Thoreau, Going Clear. We did. We were part of lots of things that were being done. That at the time we really thought that's the way the word was going to get get out. And uh, these days, YouTube just you just can't beat it. So yeah, those are some of the earlier people that had spoken out. My earphones just went out, so now I'm listening on speaker. So if it sounds different, it's just uh, my earphones basically just ran out of charge. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for that question, Suzanne. Uh, this is from Michael uh, Wincoop. Uh, question, will Shelley turn on DM in the Church of Scientology? I doubt it. No, me too. She's yeah. loyal to L. Ron Hubbard. She is, and she's she, in her way, she's taken care of in the yeah. Scientology way. She can do what she wants within reason in a location that they can keep an eye on her. So, yeah, it, it is. It, the weirdest thing about it is that this guy can just disappear somebody and everybody's cool with it. And even the person themselves is just like, well, I screwed up. Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks for that question. Next one from one A B A S P question for both. Uh, what were your in base nicknames? Well, Mofo afterwards, obviously, but uh, no, I didn't. It was just always Click or CLIC. It was always CLIC. Yeah, Click. a lot of people don't know that a if you don't have a nickname, a lot of times you're just referred to as your post title. Right. So I was referred to as uh, Pancake QC. Most people would call me Mark. But then also when I was the pre-production director, my crew would call me PPDG the pre-production director gold. So they PPDG. And then I was assistant producer gold and they called me APG. And, but um, I had a pancake though, right? Hey, go see pancake. I never, no one really ever called me pancake, but they did call me Max for a while. My nickname was Max and people would call me Max. Um, there were no other Maxes at the property. There was tons of marks. So, um max was a good name and i like max my dog's name's max <laughs> i hate um 
Miscavige used to call me Fisher all the time. Fisher. Yeah. Fisher. Yeah. I hate that. When yeah, he used to call me Headley. To the, to the point where after I left Scientology and was out in the real world, I had a boss that I worked for all of a sudden started calling me Fisher. And you're and like, no. Aside and I said, sir, I respect you. Please don't ever call me by my last name. I, yeah. I, I do not like it <laughs> at all. You know? Yeah. I was known as Headley. When you hear that, Fisher, Fisher, I'm like. (laughs) Yeah. They would call me Headley, and I would get called Headless a lot. Hey, Headless. (laughs) Yeah, no, he he could could bastardize names. Yeah. 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 All right. So next one here. All right. Japan of Green Gables question. Do you think they still use telexes in the Sea Org? I doubt it. They 100% do. They, they? they, They do it electronically now. But the coding and the date format and the number form, they use all that, but just electronically. They send the same things back and forth. It's ridiculous. But because L. Ron Hubbard said that's the way you do it, they got to do it that way forever. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Steve Britton, another question. Did you ever consider playing a duplicate for David Miscavige and telling him it was the master and then play the master and tell him it was a duplicate just to see what he says. I didn't do this, but a lot of the professional mixers, um, it was a, it was kind of an inside gag with them where they would be mixing an event or doing a video mix down or a music mix down. And he would tell them, Oh, uh, it just seems a little heavy on the bass, or I think in this section you got to brighten it up a little bit. And then they would do nothing and tell him they did that. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, it's perfect now. And they would do that at live events, and they would also do that in recordings. This was a very common thing for him to say, I want this. And then they'd say they did it. And then he would acknowledge, oh, it's much better now. And they'd be like, we didn't fucking do anything. You're fucking maniac. Great. Thanks, Stephen. We got another question here. This is from Cece. She's a member of our channel, and uh, we want to thank you for being a member of our channel. Was Paulette Auten same post as Renee Norton? Paulette tried to promote me to Int Flag Banking Office, so she came to me at AOLA from over the rainbow. She said uh, Miscavige had approved it per the routing on the legal size folder cover 9496. I don't know Paulette Auten. Do you do you know? Never heard of Paulette Auten. Um, Renee Norton was the supercargo golden era productions. So she wouldn't have anything to do with anybody else except for golden era productions or if she was getting somebody from los angeles or an organization somewhere nearby a c organization that was a person was going to be promoted to golden era productions she um she was demoted and offloaded from the international property in the 90s and she she became the what's called the commanding officer of one of the Los Angeles area organizations. And it was um, Asho Foundation, which is the Advanced St. Hill Organization of Los Angeles. And um, they would were the ones that operated at nighttime and on the weekends. And um, she, had, she started a slogan, the night church is the right church. <laughs> but I don't even know if she's still in the C organization. I think she worked with Aaron. I'm pretty sure Aaron, A.A. Ron, worked at Asho. Um, so I'm pretty sure he's familiar with Renee Norton. Yeah, he might I, even had a, a dust up or two with her. She's a firecracker. Let me ask you this. Who, did, who would you rather deal with in gold, Mark? Wendell Reynolds or Jason Bannock? Wendell, in a second. Wendell was very, um, he used to be, Wendell Reynolds was the commanding officer of Golden Air Productions. And this dude, I describe this guy in my book. And anybody who knows Wendell Reynolds and reads my book will say that the description of him is the most accurate description of a person they've had. This dude would wear a shirt that looked like he ironed it while he was wearing it. It yeah, was looked like he was straight out of the Ivy League or straight out of the United States Navy. He he was perfectly dressed at all times, right? And he would he he was a smoker and it, and Sea Org members smoke. And if you're a smoking Sea Org member, 
at the end base, usually you smoked camel non-filters. This guy would reach, we, we had uh, polyester, uh, like fake Navy uniforms, and they had breast pockets. He would reach into his breast pocket where he had a pack of cigarettes and just pull out a single cigarette. It was the most, it was like a magic trick. And he would do it all day long. He'd just be like, and you'd be like, and and then he and then you'd see the pack on the desk or something later. It did. It wasn't all open at the top. It had the same little tiny part torn open, just like everybody else. And you're like, how is he doing that? How is he just taking on this? But uh, he literally looked like, and his hair was always slicked Perfect. back. He looked, back. He looked like Pat Riley from the Lakers. He looked. Yeah. Ident he was tall like Pat oh, Riley. He, he had the exact too. same haircut and he played basketball. That's true. He'd look like Pat. I didn't know who Pat Riley was when I wrote the yeah, book. You you After living in LA, I was like, oh, I get it. But that is a very perfect uh, description of his hairdo. But yeah. he had this slick back hairdo. And you would see him at 8 30 in the morning at the we'd have a muster the co of every organization stands at the front in the middle of the the crew and he says okay today we're going to do this you see him at 8 30 at muster with that hair you could see him nine hours later at the later at night his shirt and pants had not a uh, accumulated a wrinkle not one hair had been out of place he looked he just looked like a he looked like he like was he had like Madame Tussauds fucking Mac wax figure that could never be, he was never dirty either, which is a weird thing. Look, even in Renault's, we used to wear blue boiler suits with blue baseball caps. That was the uniform with black, yep. black boots. It was immaculate. His Perfect. <laughs> yep. And his boots were perfectly shined. His, because uh, I remember when he got in trouble, he was working for me. Whenever anybody at the International Horde would get busted, they would uh, come and work in sets or props or they do like labor, hard labor for the film unit. And he was building sets for a while and he was wearing that, like you said, an estates uniform. And he would, he would get out of the van, they would bring him to this uh, Air Force base we were shooting at. And he'd get out and I'd be like, are you kidding me? Uh, really? With this outfit, you can do the same exact thing. It's just like perfectly pressed, shines perfect. Everybody else hasn't shined their shoes in three years. They're got stains and paint and oil and no not this dude very you know who else immaculate. smoked unfiltered camels for years was miscavige he was two yeah. packs a day when i worked for him but i don't know if you knew this or not because i think he quit at some point he used to use chewing tobacco skull bandits he would have yeah. those little packets and he put it between his cheek and gum when he wasn't smoking and then he had a little spittoon that he would spit in I, mean, I heard was, yeah was a real i heard that from somebody else i mean i had the um you when you when you're in the sea org you're not going to put a cigarette out halfway through no that's, you save it i don't smoke but a, i saw it all the time that's a lot of but no but if you smoked it all the way through you'd smoke it down to the cherry there was no filter yeah. so you'd, you'd you'd literally be holding a coal and you'd be like you need a roach clip in order to hold it so well, you don't no. your fingers well if you smoke long enough and you're in the sea org your fingers just yeah. get blisters and they're but my forefinger and my thumb were completely yellow from the nicotine yeah, and just just always and um yeah i don't i can't yeah, imagine I smoking a camel not health. filter i speculated on his health about a week ago on a video because two packs a day of camels skull bandits chewing tobacco and then after i left i heard cigar well he started doing cigars when i was there and then drinking whiskey. And I think Tom DeVox said he was drinking a bottle of whiskey a night or something. That McAllen, that McAllen 15 year. But also he. Um, His health, he's, he's, look, I have friends that are my age that were in the city yeah. that have passed away recently. You yeah. Know, how can his health be at 63 years old when he's been abusing? Plus he has asthma. You know what I mean? And he, he, he takes a ton of human growth hormone. I didn't know that. When he was working out and um doing lots of that kind of stuff so i'm not sure but he does have a private chef and yeah, I, I think know. he's trying to get more healthy but he looks i'm just well, gonna I mean, say about his stress level 
I mean, yes. he lives in a cocoon of security. He can't go anywhere. He's like yeah. Hubbard. I, I said that he's like Hubbard. He's in hiding now from all the lawsuits and the and the the private investigators and the, the, the process servers. He's in hiding. Now, he's living a luxurious life in that hiding, but he can't get, just go out and do things. I mean, if he's spotted, he's going to get served, you know? And yeah. so he's really become, you know, a, in a cocoon. He you know? also... I'm going to say from working there and then living out in the real world, you know, since 2005 now, um, stress is a great driver of sickness and disease. Yeah. And and that dude is throwing tantrums and stressed out 24-7. So um, I can't imagine that that's um, healthy for the body. And anyone who's knew him and worked with him and sees the pictures that they have up on the Internet or these videos – I mean, he looks like he looks like he's aged thirty more years than he. Absolutely. He kind of looks like an old, uh, kind of like one bugs, of the right, Mark. Definitely, yeah, like, bugs. I, I, oh, I've yeah. Seen, I've seen pictures of his brother Ronnie and his dad. Brother Ronnie's bald, right? And and I go, he's got this full pompadour. Are you kidding me? That's either a yeah. DNA or a hair plug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he definitely. I still got my hair, not a lot, but I still got. <laughs> hey, hair. I'm I'm good too. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, he doesn't. He looks odd. Uh, at least I'll say that he looks a bit odd compared to what he used to look like. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I started thinking about it because, you know, you know, the people that I know that have recently passed away, they're like 65, 66 years old. You know, it's not out of the question that he could have poor health and something happened to him. And then well, my whole question is, Who's he grooming to take over? Do you ever yeah, see anybody? Not. There's yeah, nobody young enough. Number one, he doesn't trust anybody. Yeah. So anybody he so, oh, I'm going to groom you to take over. Ah, he chop him up, you know? Yeah. The other thing you got to dig is Seward members are putting in 120 hour weeks every week. So when I, I, I added it up, I was there for 15 years and I put in about 45 years. If you just did a nine to five job, yeah. I put in 45 years of work in the 15 years that I was there. Um, if you just base it on a nine to five week. Yeah. So if you're doing that, he's, I'm pretty sure he got in when he was like six, 15 or 16. He was 16. He just dropped out of high school. I, I met him a month later when I joined the Sea Org. So yeah. We so yeah. 16 he's what 67 at well, 63 he? no he's 63, 63. He's younger than me yeah i don't I'm, I'm not a math whiz but that <laughs> seems like it might be over 40 years worth of uh nonsense and stress and drama and tantrums yeah, and, and I, I also said look he has no f real friends he has no family He's got his wife hidden away. He doesn't get along with his, his other sisters and stuff like that. He's yeah. basically going to die alone. You know what I mean? He, he's going to be like Hubbard in hiding somewhere yeah. and be no, afraid. He, that's yeah, he's, our, that's he's already. Or he'll be in a jail cell by himself. Yeah, he's already got the, Masavi, the uh, Hubbard playbook going great. His family is wrecked. <laughs> None of his relatives want anything to do with Scientology. Oh, and... He's banished his wife. We the next stage he's is hiding from the law. Yeah, the next stage is FBI raid. That's right. where that's where we're at in this uh, story. So, then after the FBI raid, then he goes into um, seclusion, and we never hear well, from that's him. That's what again. I said. I said he's probably got money stashed somewhere. He's probably already researched where uh, the non extradition treaties are, so he can go to some country where they can't touch him. And he's basically his his history in the future is already laid out for him, anyway. And hopefully he'll get him he'll get imprisoned and put in jail. Yeah, I think I think he's on track. He's the Hubbard playbook's going right right the way it should. Yeah. Let me go through the we got just a few more and we'll get to awesome. Here. Uh, Steve Britton, did did Golden Air ever use uh, digital audio tape uh, for masters? We we didn't use them as masters. We did use DATS. Um, was a, I want to say DATS were a Sony format and we did use DATS in the mixed, um, studios and in the audio recording, we would use DATS as like a backup, not as a master, but as a digital, uh, backup. And also we would use DATS to a B mixes. So if there was a, a mix down that was done, 
um, they'd they'd offload that to DAT, and then if there were copies of that made for other areas, we'd A B that against the DAT. Good question, Stephen Britton. Stephen Britton is a uh, frequent flyer. I don't know what they call them. Do you guys have um, like uh, peelers or what do you call? Yeah, well, do you... Our, our channel members are like mas peeling masters, peeling <laughs> professionals, and peeling Peel. supporters. We were going to call them master peelers. The channel <laughs> told me we should turn it around. <laughs> master peel. So yeah, they're, they're called the peeling masters. Not master for peelers. for a while, they were calling themselves cracker lickers over on our channel. <laughs> yeah, I'm a cracker licker. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Uh, let me see here. I got another one here for you. Where is it at? Uh, here, I think this is another one from Steve. Uh, question: When are we going to see a film of your bookmark, and who would you want to play you? Mm. I don't know. I don't. I know that um, I was contacted by somebody um, that wanted to do, to get the rights, but they wanted to get it in Europe. They didn't want it in the United States. They wanted to buy the rights for Europe, and I was like, "Well, that would be. I'll definitely." you know give somebody the rights but i'd rather do it in the u.s first but people have done um carla um uh, a scientology a former scientologist um that was an actress that we used at golden air productions her name was carla zamudio and her, her herself and another woman by the name of i want to say her name was rachel myers they did a short of a short film um, of my book. And it was actually very cool. And um, yeah, I would love for somebody to do that. It's not really like my thing. Um, like if somebody wants to do it, then I would be okay with doing it. But yeah, it's, um, kind of hard. it's kind of hard because of all the language and all the stories are so intricate. I mean, yeah. you know, you and I would watch some movie of your book or of somebody else's book. We go like, oh, they're just skimming the surface. You know, what they I mean? really could they show they, it all. Yeah, yeah. How do you fit a book into two? I mean, obviously, people could do it. Yeah. But um, Danny Masterson definitely don't want him to play me. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I would say, um, like, I think like Matt Damon would be a good me there now. You go. No. That's a, I don't know. I don't or um the guy that plays uh Hawkeye. I love oh, that. Yeah, dude. yeah. Jeremy, Jeremy Renner. Yeah. I feel like I've got like a maybe Jenny Re Je Jeremy Renner's got like a Mark vibe. Yeah. Okay, this is uh Denver Steve oh hey buddy, I see you here. He's a good guy, good friend. Yes. Uh he said I would have been considered a wimp. I smoke camel lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I play when I first started smoking. I smoked marble reds and then I smoked camel lights. And then when I went to the amp base, it was like, oh, camel lights are for the weak. <laughs> you want to be a boss, you got to smoke camel straights. Those things you, are hardcore. How long ago did you quit? Oh, I quit. Uh, I mean, I haven't smoked. I, I think I quit smoking camel uh, straights when I was still at the base. I after I left, I smoked here and there, and sometimes I'll have a cigarette just casually. But I don't really, I don't need to smoke. I don't have to smoke. Um, I'm like kind of, um, I don't know how to say it. I'm like a pretty high strung kind of guy. I've got a lot of, um, I got a lot of energy, so I'm not trying to stimulate anything. I'm trying well, to, if anything, I'm trying to like calm down. <laughs> well, well, let me ask you this question: What do you like to do for fun? I mean, like obviously, aside from the channel and yeah, the work you do, what do you like to do? Like, what is your relaxation or fun thing you like to do? Um, my latest thing is I've been doing a lot of fishing. I go fishing with my uh, my youngest and my middle kid a lot, and um. Yeah, just uh, fishing, fishing, just doing stuff with the kids. Anything with the kids, I consider fun. So I'll take. I went, took my uh, middle guy to a concert the other night in Denver, and um, yeah, I'll take them to concerts if they want to go. Even if it's music I don't like, I'll still. I, be, I went. I went and saw Billie Eilish at Red Rocks, and yeah, um, yeah stuff like that. Um, concerts, going to comedy, going to concerts and fishing or camping or 
going to the mountains with the, we live in Colorado. So we like to go skiing or uh, sledding or, you know, snowmobiling, stuff like that. Who's your favorite comedian? Um, that's hard. I like Tom Segura. I'd say Tom Segura right now is probably, I like him the most. And I sort of, um, yeah, I respect what he's done and he's also a podcaster and, um, and I kind of, um, I don't know, it's something about him and his wife, Christina, cause they have a podcast together. And, um, I just went and saw Christina, his wife, Christina P recently, and I actually hung out with her for a while and we talked and we talked about Scientology and a bunch of that. I would love to go on, um, their podcast, your mom's house, but, um, yeah, I like, I like Anthony Jeselnik. Um, I'm old school. I like, he's no longer alive, but I love Rodney Dangerfield. Oh Maybe yeah. YouTube, no. I watch of Rodney Dangerfield. I am on the floor laughing and I saw him live at Bally's here in Las Vegas when he was still alive. Yeah. And I had never laughed so hard in my life. Yeah. I like, I like Rodney, Carlin, Murphy, yeah. um, guys, Pryor. Yeah. I like those guys too. I grew up, my dad was a big fan of comedy. So yeah. I grew up every night. When I was a little kid, I'd stay up and I'd watch The Tonight Show before I went to sleep with Johnny Carson. And um, and I watched roasts and yeah. like oh, when, they're uh, great. They're yeah, great. They're really when you funny. got, um, like they're uncensored because they could tell some really dirty, funny jokes. Yeah, we had, my dad had HBO, so he was playing, I was watching roasts and, um, Lots of that stuff. And I'm so I'm a fan of that. I'm, I'm sort of a fan of roast comedy. Yeah. So I like um, there's a show called Kill Tony oh. with uh, Tony Hinchcliffe. Big fan of that show. I watch that every week. And um, yeah, I'm kind of kind of uh, getting into the whole Austin comedy scene right now yeah. and uh, probably planning a trick down trip down there to the mothership to see some guys down there but okay, i got uh, one last question i want to ask you okay yeah what's the best part about being a parent because i've i got out of the science sea org and i never have had kids and you obviously this is an older photo but you've got three kids and yeah and i wanted to find out i wanted to end on a positive what what's your favorite thing about being a dad um i think my favorite thing about being as a dad is um trying to teach my kids all the things that nobody told me and so not not just the stuff you learn in the school but like you know saving money and doing what you want like what you have a passion and doing as opposed what i want them to do or what right. they somebody told them they should do like try to figure out what you like to do or what your interests are and try to do that kind of thing don't 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 do anything because you think you have to or because life is in the situation it's in something bad is kind of forcing you into a something try to um you know try to follow your passion and and also if if you're if you're if you feel like you've done something of value and you can do that as a living and people can pay you to do something that you like doing and that is a genuinely a valuable thing try to do that because otherwise um you know what do they say do work whatever you work in do work that you love not work that you're doing because you got to get paid and yeah, it's if not you can you enjoy that you have a passion for i mean yeah. that's, secret, that's really the secret to work absolutely yeah so i try to oh. You know, and I try to expose them to lots of different things um, in life so that they can see that, um, you know, if you if you're a good person, good things will happen to you. And, um, you know, if you're a bad person, it's likely bad things are going to happen to you. Yeah. So try to do more good and also try to um, don't try not to just be a consumer try to everyone's a consumer to to some degree or another but if yeah. you're also a producer and you're putting good things into the world then that's a good balance so try to try to not just consume things try to also give something back to the world that's well, that's great 
but oh, um, I love my you. kids. My kids are like great. my my world. So yeah, I understand. Well, I want to thank you for being on here, Mark. I mean, we could do we could do hours because there's so we many. We could do things. another time. Yeah, we know this is going to be the only time we do it. No, we no, can do if there's other times, yeah. Yeah, if there's other questions you had or I, I mean, I we've well, well there's we, things, you, things you don't know that I was involved in before you ever got to the base. Yeah, that I could tell you stories about that. You go, oh yeah, really? Oh yeah, you know what I mean? I know it's so wild. Anyway, yeah. I just. I just wanted to do the wrap up business here. Please subscribe sure. to our channel. Um, our Scientology stories peeling the onion. If you've enjoyed this, hit that like button and the notification button. Do the same for Mark at Loan for Good, I think is your channel address. Um, but anyway, we'd appreciate it if you would uh, subscribe. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments section. I'd like to know any feedback or opinion. Just go down there and ask. And if you want to order any of our merchandise, go down there as well. And then the last thing I wanted to mention too is if you want to buy me a coffee, some people like to donate money and that type of thing, buy me a coffee, or you can go to our merch site. You can donate on our merchandise site and they don't take any of the money. It's not like YouTube nice. where they do a super chat or whatever. They take 30%. Yeah. No, on our fourth wall that you donate, it's a hundred percent to the channel. So nice. anyway, I would appreciate that. Anything else you'd like to say, Mark, before we end off? No, I appreciate it. Hopefully um, this works out for your channel and you get lots of views. And um, yeah. yeah, we could even do, if you want, we could do like an imp based deep dive every once oh, in absolutely. a while. And we absolutely. could just talk about the imp based stuff. There's not a lot of, I mean, I'm, I want to do some videos with Sterling because um, unlike you, he was there for most of the time I was. You yeah. bail. You were gone in 1990, right? I left September 15th, 1990. There you go. So literally, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's we like didn't we even. Up. I'm there, and then I'm gone, and you're there. You know, it's like uh, Janice and her husband Paul were also at the Imp base. Yeah. But remember when I told you there was that flood in August of 1990? Yeah. That's the day they blew the base. I well, think. and I blew that same day the second time we both blew the same time without speaking to each other oh i didn't know you also blew on the oh, same yeah. day at the yeah. same time yeah because i went miss scavage is crazy <laughs> at the mouth yeah breathing in the front of the goal i'm standing next to paul we didn't even talk and we're both thinking we're out of here and i left <laughs> i had i that day they i had my car yeah uh, that night i took off too and then the funny thing was, is the next day, Mike Sutter, they came and recovered me at my sister's house because I was going crazy. I didn't want to leave yeah. my wife. And then they made the mistake when they were driving back. They said, oh, yeah, Janice and Paul, they blew last night, too. And then I went, oh, that's a big mistake because you know what? I'm, yeah. The next chance I get, I'm getting out of here because you don't know who you're going to hook up with or what you're going to do. You know. And also, we we didn't know about the Internet. No, there was no Internet. So, yeah, so <laughs> – you wouldn't even think, oh, I can just like find this person Janice wherever they are. By, by calling out of a phone book, Julie's dad in San Diego. And that's how nice. She found me. That's awesome. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we could do a D. Yeah. So that's a great idea. We should just every once in a while, maybe once a month or every few weeks whatever or whatever you want. You want. Uh, we could just do an imp based deep dive. I love just talking about it just to document it. And also oh, yeah. there's people that are going to watch this video that aren't watching Aaron's channel. They're the one not right. my channel. So they might, somebody might stumble upon this, but then if anybody ever talks about the imp base or searches the imp base, this video will come up as a search result. Cause it's got imp base yeah, and, and has a we, keyword and they'll find out all about it. That's right. And <laughs> we use photographs too. I mean, Janice has a lot of photos. Yeah. photos. So, you know, we put a little bit of, you know, visual there as well as telling the story. So it's cool nice anyway. hey thanks very much mark Until no problem dude time, appreciate bye, it bye everybody thanks for watching and we'll see you bye next guys time.